This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door into my dread domicile of disaster. Come in. Come into my parlor of panic. Or would you rather sit out here on the terrace of terror? Hmm? Oh, a bit cool out here. All right, let's go indoors by all means. The house itself is always warm. You see, I had the painter give it two coats. <laughs> all of it built solely for your poignant pleasure and dolorous diversion. The price? Oh, so reasonable. Only a pint down and a pint a month for as long as you live. Pint of what? You know what. <laughs> Tonight's inner sanctum mystery, The Eyes of My Murderer, was written by Emil Tepperman and stars Donald Buker in the role of Barry with Charlotte Holland as Carolyn. Now, let's get down to business. Tonight, we hear the story of Carolyn Medford and the strange things that happened to her when she came to visit her aunt, Loretta Medford, on that grim evening of the 10th of June. But before we hear Carolyn's story, it will be necessary to consult a police report for the facts covering the three hours preceding Carolyn's arrival. I, Otto Frayne, lieutenant of detectives in charge of the Longview County Homicide Department, make this report of my own free will. It is well known that I have been collaborating with Loretta Medford, the writer, on a new radio series of half-hour shows based on my experiences as a homicide detective, which was to star Barry Adams in the featured role. Each evening at nine, after finishing my regular tour of police duty, it has been my custom to drive out to Loretta Medford's summer place on the North Shore, about five miles from town. There, we three, Loretta, Barry, and I would work on the series till well after midnight. Last night, the 10th of June, I left my office as usual promptly at 9. It was exactly 9.16 and one half by my dashboard clock when I turned in from the highway to the private road leading along the shorefront to Loretta's cottage. I was a bit puzzled when I got out of the car because neither Loretta nor Barry Adams were on the porch where they usually waited for me. At that instant, it was exactly 9.17. I recall checking the time on my wristwatch to make sure I wasn't too early. 9.17. It was at that precise moment that I heard the scream. It was coming from the direction of the private boat dock at the rear of the house. I ran across the lawn toward the dock with my gun in my hand. But when I reached the dock, there was nothing to be seen or heard. The darkness was thick, thick and black. And then, not ten feet away from me, I heard Loretta's voice. No, 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 please, don't, no, no, no. I couldn't see anything. And yet I knew someone was here. Someone who had just stabbed Loretta to death and cast her body off the dock. Someone who probably still had a bloody knife in his hand. Then I saw him. He was only a couple of feet away from me. Just a blur in the night. Too dark to see his face. But when he spoke... I knew him. That you, Otto? Barry. Barry Adams. What happened, Otto? For heaven's sake, tell me what happened. Huh? Suppose you tell me what happened. That was Loretta. Yes, I know it was Loretta. Well, why are we standing here? Why don't we look for her try to help her? You know there's no use looking for her. Her body went over the side, and you know the current here is strong enough to carry her right out to sea. She was murdered right here in the dark. And I wasn't ten feet away. Were you that far away? What? What did you say? Why did you kill her, Barry? Don't be a fool, Otto. I was walking around on the other side of the house when I heard the scream. Why, I must have got here about the same time you did. Sorry, Barry, I can't buy that. Look here, Otto. You know I'm going to marry Carolyn, don't you? Yes, I know you're going to marry Carolyn. Well, then how can you imagine I'd kill her out? It's no use, Barry. You can't talk yourself out of it. You've got to be the killer. There's no one else here on the dock. What about you? What? You're on the dock. I... I just got here. So you say. The house is so quiet. Hadn't we better wake up Mrs. Finch? Later. We take a look in Loretta's library just to you make... You have to keep that gun stuck in my back. Go on. Open the door. I... I can't. 
What's the matter with you? I... I have a feeling we'll see Loretta in there. As always, with the dictating machine. With a cigarette between her lips. That's your conscience. I've seen lots of murderers. Their conscience usually gets them shortly after the crime. I didn't kill her. If Loretta were here, she'd tell us. But she isn't. She's out in the sea, wet and cold, no. with seaweed clinging to her, and your knife still in her throat. Stop it! Stop it! Well, will you open that door? All right. <gasps> well, what? What is it? Why did you close that door again? Loretta. She's in there. You're crazy. She's in there, I tell you. Her hair all matted from the sea. A bloody wound in her throat. Get out of the way. Don't! Don't open it! Trying to tell me you saw a ghost? Well, if you didn't kill her, her ghost won't hurt you. Well, where is she? She... She isn't here. <laughs> so you saw Loretta, huh? I tell you, I saw her. With a wound in her throat. Say, how did you know she'd been stabbed in the throat? What do you mean? Just before you said she was floating in the sea with a knife in her throat. How did you know where she'd been stabbed? Oh, I... I didn't know. But you said it. Well, that was just third-degree stuff. I was trying to paint a picture for you to break you down. We do it every day with murderers. That's the way I saw her just now. Sure, my picture made it so vivid in your mind, you thought you saw her. Proves you killed her. This is no illusion. She was right there, I tell you. Before the mirror. Yes. What was she doing? Standing or sitting? She... Or just floating? I... I don't know. All I saw was her face, her tangled hair, her throat in one hand. She... she was pointing at something. You got it bad, Barry. Want to sign a confession? She was looking right at me and pointing over there to the dictating machine. Oh, the machine, huh? How do you make this thing work? Move the needle back to the start of the cylinder. Now press the playback switch. Right there. I don't hear anything. Press the button on the speaking tube. Oh. Well? Shh. Tonight, I am going to die. I am going to be murdered. I know because I've seen it in the eyes of my murderer. I even know the plan. The current that runs past the boat dock. The freak current that catches up any object thrown to it and carries it out to the sea. My body is to disappear. There will be no corpus delecti. Anyone else might be frightened, but I'm not. I know that I shall come back. I know that I shall be able to point to my murderer. And what's more important, protect Carolyn. Yes, Carolyn is next. That's the end, the end of the record. Good heavens, Arthur. She knew she was going to be murdered. And she knew the killer. She... She said she'd come back. Well, she's dead. But she did come back. She pointed at the dictating machine. And Carolyn's in danger, too. Good heavens. She's coming in on the midnight train. I've got to meet her. I'll have to leave now. You're not going anywhere, Barry. I'm arresting you for the murder of Loretta Medford. You can't do that, Otto. Who'll meet Carolyn? Don't worry about that. After I get you safely in a cell, I'll meet your Carolyn for you. You want to get me out of the way, in a cell, so you can meet Carolyn and kill her, too. You're the killer. Now, look, that kind of talk won't get you anywhere. I won't let you do it. I'm getting out of your seat. No! I won't let you ten times! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! <laughs> what? Loretta! What? What? I must have been mistaken. Imagine it. I let... Barry get away. I'll never find him in the dark. That voice could have sworn. Good evening, Lieutenant Bane. And what is it that you could have sworn? Mrs. Finch. Please excuse the night clothes. I was rudely awakened in the midst of a troubled sleep. Mrs. Finch, did you... Did you just call out to me just now? Did you say, don't shoot, Otto? I'd not be likely to say such a thing to you, Lieutenant Frayne. And... Was it Mr. Barry you were going to shoot, whom I just saw scooting out of here like a streak of lightning? Oh, I, I don't understand a thing like this. A thing like what? I just heard, or, or thought I heard, Loretta Medford say something to me. Oh, and not being Scotch like me, you don't understand how it was that a 
dead woman spoke to you. How did you know she was dead? You needn't become so excited. It was in my sleep I saw. You, you saw her in your sleep? Yes, and it troubled me so that I awoke. She came before me with her hair all dank and tangled and the salt water glistening on her face in the dark and her throat bleeding and raw. You... You saw her like that? Oh, yes. And she spoke to me. I don't believe you. I, I don't believe in such things. You don't, eh? Then who was it that spoke to you a moment ago and told you not to shoot? I... I don't know. Remember, I told you this was really Carolyn Medford's story. You've heard Lieutenant Otto Frayne's report of what happened before midnight. That was just the introduction. Now we come to the crux of the story. What happened after midnight? When that gadabout ghost really started to walk. And here's Caroline herself to tell it. It's not difficult to imagine the sense of shock with which I read Otto's report of the murder of Aunt Loretta. It was Otto who met me at the train instead of Barry. He, Barry, he didn't explain where Barry was. In, instead, he handed me the report that he had typed at the headquarters before coming to meet me. I read it in his car with the aid of a flashlight while he drove to Aunt Loretta's. When I finished reading, I just sat there with the papers in my lap. I felt something tight catching in my throat. I couldn't cry. If I had been able to cry, it might have been better. I'm sorry, Carolyn, about Barry. I don't believe it. How well do you know him? When did you first meet? Last time I visited here, in April, when school closed for Easter. Oh, you were only here for a week. We've written regularly ever since. He proposed to me by mail. So you don't really know him very well. Well enough to marry him, Arthur. A man could be that kind of killer, and you'd never guess it to look at him or talk to him, or even from the way he made love to you. Please, Otto. I'm sorry. You know how I feel about you, don't you? Yes, I know. If it weren't for Barry... If it weren't for Barry, I might have a chance. Hmm? Oh, Otto, please be kind to him. You love him so much? All right, Carolyn. I'll tear up that report. Oh, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't mean that, Otto. I mean, prove that he's innocent. Find the real killer. Otto, don't you see? It might have been somebody else, a madman, maybe an escaped lunatic. There's only one trouble with that theory, Carolyn. What? I was the only other person on the dock. The cottage was brilliant with lights in every room when we arrived, as if to drive away evil spirits and ghosts. I was so tired and numb from the long train ride and from the shattering news I had heard that I stood with my eyes half closed while Otto rang the bell and Mrs. Finch opened the door. Come in, Miss Carolyn. Oh, come in, Lieutenant. Ah. My men all gone? Yes, they left a little while ago. Oh, Miss Carolyn, you look exhausted. <laughs> come, I have your room ready. You'll be wanting to sleep. Yes. If only you'll not be bothered by any apparition. Ah, uh, just a minute. Yes, Otto. Mrs. Finch, what makes you think she'll be bothered by an apparition? Didn't it come to me? Didn't Mr. Barry see it? Didn't it even make itself heard to you, a scoffer? Then it will surely come to Miss Carolyn. You believe that, Carolyn? I don't know, Otto. Loretta was so interested in the supernatural, the possibility of communicating with the dead. If you look in her library, you'll find she has almost every book ever written on the subject. That may be so, but do you believe in it? Loretta often told me if she died before I did, she'd manage to get in touch with me. <laughs> Mrs. Finch, who could have hated Loretta enough to kill her? Don't bother your pretty head with that now. There'll be time for talk in the morning. No, I, I want to know now. Be better to sleep now. No, please, Mrs. Finch. You knew her. You knew her so well. You, you've been with her for 14 years. Yes, 14 years. Long enough to learn to hate her. What? What did you say? 
Don't look so startled. You too have cause to hate her, and so has Mr. Barry. What are you talking about? Her, with her 38 years weighing heavy on her, and all those peroxides and creams and shampoos that she used. You know why? Because she wanted Mr. Barry for herself. Oh, no, I can't believe that. Burned her inside to think of Mr. Barry marrying you. She would gladly have died to stop it. And hasn't she done it? She goaded Mr. Barry into killing her, and now he'll be hunted and caught and executed. And wherever she is at this moment, if she can laugh, she's laughing. Oh, no, 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 Mrs. Finn. How long I lay there after Mrs. Finch had left, I don't know. I was cold, cold and shivering. My eyes were wide and sleepless as I lay caught in the bed, and my nerves were raw. So raw that the slightest sound grated. I sound at the window. My eyes flew toward it, and I glimpsed at the shapeless form out there in the night. And I saw the window slowly inching up. I must have leaped up by instinct like a terrified animal. And I was at the door, and it snatched it up. The corridor was still. There wasn't a sound. I dared not look back into my room at the window. I ran across the hall and pulled open the door of Mrs. Finch's room. <laughs> Mrs. Finch! Mrs. Finch! There was no answer. The room was empty. Mrs. Finch wasn't there. Blindly, I turned and ran to the stairs. How I got down them without falling, I'll never know. But at the foot of the stairs, I stopped. And everything within me seemed to congeal. For there, at my feet, lay the body of Mrs. Finch. And her eyes were wide and staring. And her mouth was set in a terrible grin. And her head rested at a crazy angle on her shoulder. For her throat was cut almost from ear to ear. Stop it! Caroline, stop it, I tell you, stop it! It's all right, Caroline, darling. It's all right, darling. It's I, Barry. There, there now. Take it easy, honey. That's right. I felt the glaze leaving my eyes and the rush of blood subsiding from my temples. And then I saw Barry. He was standing there, and in his hand was a knife. And blood was dripping from the blade. Oh, now, take it easy, Caroline. Barry, the knife you killed. Oh, I didn't kill Mrs. Finch. I just picked the knife up in the kitchen. The killer must have thrown it away. Oh. Who's that? It's Otto. He must have heard me scream. He was watching for you outside in his car. I've got to get away, Caroline. Why are you looking at me like that? You don't think I killed Mrs. Finch? Or Loretta? Oh, that's... Stand still, Barry, or I'll shoot to kill. Now, don't move while I climb in through this window. Otto! All right, Barry. Drop the knife. Well, can you talk your way out of this one? Now, look here, Otto. They stood there arguing, and I didn't know what they were saying. I only felt a great and terrible weariness, as if I had had enough of living and would welcome death if only it meant sleep and rest. When I awoke, everything was still. I must have fainted. I realized with a shock where I was. I was in Loretta's bedroom, her bedroom, which adjoined the library. I pushed myself off the bed and went over to the library door. I could hear Barry and Otto talking in the library. Their voices were heated. Numbly, my fingers found the catch and locked the door. Then I went to the other door leading to the corridor, and I turned the catch on that one, too. All I wanted was to be alone forever. Alone with the terrible throbbing in my temples and the emptiness that inside of me. I had to believe Otto now. In spite of myself, I had to believe him. I had seen Barry with that knife in his hand. Oh, shots from the library. I sat up in the bed. Two men in the library. One of them had killed the other. Which? Otto had had the gun, but Barry might have tricked him somehow. Which? Which was dead? Which was alive? <coughs> Someone was trying the library door. Oh, which one? Carolyn! Can you hear me, Carolyn? Are you awake? Barry. Open the door, Carolyn! I must talk to you. I won't answer. You'll think I'm asleep. Carolyn! Someone has killed Otto. He was shot through the window. Let me in, I tell you. I've got to protect you. I ought to let him in. Let him kill me. 
What's the use of living? Loretta said she would come to me. Maybe if Loretta comes, she'll take me back with her to the land of the dead. An excellent idea, Carolyn. Loretta, you did come back as you promised. As you see, Carolyn. But, but why isn't your hair all matted and dank and the way the others saw you and, and the wound in your throat that the others saw? The others saw what I wanted them to see, Carolyn. I, I, I don't understand, Loretta. Do you mean that you're really not dead? Exactly, my dear. But you were murdered out on the dock. Barry and Otto heard it. They heard it. But they didn't see it. Was it a trick? Yes, dear, it was a trick. I was never on the dock. I was beneath it in a rowboat. Oh. Yes. And I screamed from the rowboat and made Barry and Otto each think that the other had murdered me. That gun you're holding, you, you just shot Otto with it? Yes, of course. So Barry is really innocent? Yes, dear. Oh, Loretta, you've done all of this because you really hate me. Yes, dear. I hate you so terribly that I'd be happy to die if I could destroy you with myself. It's on account of Barry, isn't it? Yes. Yes, I could have forgiven you everything. Your youth, your looks, everything but Barry. I could have had him if you hadn't come along. But now you shan't have him because I'm going to kill you. Loretta. Then when Barry's caught, he'll pay for you and for all the others. No! Oh! Barry, you killed her. I had to, Carolyn. She'd have killed you. Oh, darling, darling, don't cry. Oh, there'll be no more ghosts between us. Ever. All's well that ends in a clinch. Yeah, I, I really don't know what to say about this. It's so seldom anything on Inner Sanctum ends in a clinch. That's because it takes two to make a clinch, and we rarely have two characters left alive at the end of our story. Anyway, I suppose I could call tonight's tale a success story. You know, it's usually a story about a self-made man. Well, Loretta was a self-made ghost. Wasn't she? <laughs> we invite you to join us again next week at this time for Inner Sanctum. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> feeling the chills creeping up your spine stay tuned for more spine tingling tales but if you dare to experience real life thrills click on the link in the description prepare to be whisked away on a heart pounding journey through the bustling streets of rio de janeiro's favelas experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an american driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos don't just listen to the scares live them click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other but beware what you see may haunt you forever Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Say, do you ever find that you can't get a certain face out of your mind? Until you do, go out of your mind. Hmm? Like me and a guy named Joe, for instance. I ran into Joe accidentally the other day over at the city morgue. And Joe's been haunting me ever since. 
I can't get over the smug way he deadpanned me. And then gave me the old cold shoulder routine. I don't want to cry, baby, but I dug down plenty time and again to keep Joe from going under. But no gratitude. No gratitude at all from Joe. Mister, I'm finished with Joe for keep. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Murder Takes a Honeymoon, was written by John Robert and stars Everett Sloan in the role of George with Ann Shepard as Mary. And now for tonight's free lesson in how to improve your screen. <laughs> Ever get that folksy, woodsy feeling until you're in an absolute frenzy to get away from it all and go native? Hmm? Well, our honeymooning couple tonight got the urge until they found that living in the country was simply murder. To rhyme it, our twosome found it positively gruesome. <laughs> Stand by and we'll demonstrate. We're on a milk train somewhere in the east, huffing through the rock and rubble of desolated whistle stop country. The yellow train lights blink eerily. The hour is sometime between night and morning. One car holds just a young couple. They huddle closely, half asleep, as the train groans into another of its interminable stops. Ravenwood! Entering Ravenwood! That stop, Lawrence! Ravenwood! George. I heard him say Lawrence, too. No. Ravenwood. Lawrence is next. Oh. Oh, there must be a million of these one-horse towns. What's eating you, Mary? Oh, you look like you've just been declared an orphan. I feel like an orphan, George. Cold. I'm hungry. So far from home. We're heading home, kid. At the next stop, there's a farm. More land than you can cover in a day, and it's all yours. Wedding gift from me to you. I'm sorry, but... The country's not for me. I'm a big city girl. Oh, give it a try, huh? Come on, smile. George, I... I'm frightened. Of me? I don't know. You've suddenly changed. Buying a farm, packing up without warning, and leaving New York. And all in such a hurry. <laughs> I'm impulsive, kid. That's how I married you, remember? I dated you blind, waltzed you around once, and boom. On an impulse, I hustle you to City Hall. I bought the farm the same way. The way it happened, it, it's as if you were running away from something. Running to something, kid. I'm tired of the creeps and the phonies and the crumbs. I'm tired of stale beer, cheap movies, and crowds. Ah, okay, skip it. I'm thirsty. You want me to fetch you a drink? No, thanks. All right, I'll be back in a minute. Your imagination's gone crazy. You're overtired. George, look. What, what's that? An envelope. Someone dropped it on my lap. It fell to the floor. Give it to me. What does it say? A crank note. Some country idiot's playing black hand. Let me read it. We don't like strangers in Lewiston. Especially New Yorkers. Better be smart and read the train schedule back. There's a return train schedule attached to it. Oh, you look as if you're already on that train back. You scare easy, huh? How did anyone know we were coming? Well, that's easy. The real estate man who sold me Rain Tree Farms no doubt stuck the item in the local papers. Ah, oh, come on. Shrug it off as a crackpot practical joke. A joke? You really want me to believe that someone drove ten miles in the middle of the night to warn us off? Just to be funny? <laughs> I'm laughing. Lewiston! Lewiston! Come on, Mary. Grab that other suitcase. Come on, step on it, kid. Right, your step. 
All right. Easy does it. There we are. It's so deserted, George. Yeah, everybody's asleep. Well, what do we do? Come on, we'll camp under that station shed. It's nine miles out to Rain Tree Farms, and we'll need somebody to drive us there. I may what? do that. Oh. Drive you out. And wait and have the night for you. Who are you? Ben. Ben Myers. This is parked to the side of the chair. You said you've been waiting for me. I did. I'm your neighbor. The shack's just around the bend from Rain Tree Farms. Thought you and the lady'd be glad not to spend the night in the weather. Ah, we're glad, all right, but how did you know we were coming? I read in the papers you bought the old place. But why tonight? Why not last night or tomorrow? How did you know I was coming tonight? <laughs> I've been waiting last night. If you didn't come tonight, I'd watch for you tomorrow. The time ain't worth the leaking bucket. You coming? Yeah, sure. Come on, Mary. Here's a busy, son. Wait to light my pipe and we'll be going. Bring your face to the light, son. I've seen you before, ain't I? I don't think so. You never been around Rain Tree Farms? No, I've never seen the place. Honey, you should buy it then. Nobody's tried living in Rent Tree Farm now in two years. Why? Some say that it's haunted. Some say there's a black curse on the house. <laughs> you keep asking questions, kid. He'll have you seeing ghosts coming out of the chimney. Not ghosts, son. But corpses. <gasps> Of course. The last couple that tried living in Rain Tree Corners. They're dead in the parlor floor. I seen them with my own eyes. <laughs> dead. Nobody ever found out what killed them. Another mile to Rain Tree Farms, folks. Go on, kid. Grab yourself 40 winks. I can't, huh? I don't close my eyes. George, what was that? Stop the car. It was a bullet. Someone took a pot shot at me. Missed you by inches. Check. Almost a bullseye. Nobody's no slouch with a rifle. What's the angle on this, Myers? Can't say. Except that shooting comes naturally to these parts. This is hunting country. In the middle of the night, in the dark... Oh, night's light enough for shooting. Folks around here would rather shoot than sleep. I'm not swallowing that. Somebody tried to kill me. That's a pretty big idea, son. Yeah, well, the idea's even bigger. I figure maybe someone waited along that road in ambush and you fingered me. Maybe that's why you waited around all hours at the depot. You were to drive me to my murder. <laughs> Rentry Farms. House is up that walk. All right, hand me the luggage, Mary. Yes. Uh, thanks for the lift. Your young man ain't thanking me. <laughs> His head's busy turning with big ideas. Goodbye, son. I'll be coming around, maybe. There's some more of your big ideas. Look, if I ever see you around here, I'll shoot you full of holes on sight. For trespassing. <laughs> Yeah? About that shot on the road coming here, why would anyone want to murder you? You're a stranger. To keep me away from Rain Tree Farms, I guess. But why, if you own it? Why is a big letter, kid. George, you're concealing something. Who are you? <laughs> George Stretch, your husband. A stranger to me until ten days ago. Who are you, really? Oh, look, kid, you're letting some local crackpot give you the willies. Mary, a guy said something about for better or for worse just before I slipped a ring on your finger. Was it all a lot of idle talk? 
No, George. I meant it deep down. I'm sorry. That's more like it. What do you say we forget the spook stuff and hit the sack, huh? Coming? Mm hmm. Boy, this joint sure needs a loving touch. And a coat of paint. Well, now to find the key. Uh uh. Wrong key. The real estate office mailed me five different keys. George. Now what? Somebody's inside. I see a moving light. Yeah. And footsteps coming to the door. What are you after, mister? Well, I... I was trying to get in. What's the shotgun for? Section? You need it. Yeah. I've seen you somewhere before, haven't I? No, you haven't. I, I've never been somewhere. Who are you? I'm George Stretch. This is my wife. We're the new owners. Who are you? Parker. Willis Parker. I mean, what are you doing here? Squatting. You broke in? No. I moved in. Just like that? Uh-huh. Abandoned place. Loaded down with county tax warrants. I bought a tax warrant and I'm in. I don't get it. Squad is right. Go see a lawyer. You mean you won't get out? That's right. On what ground? Look, fella. Right now I've got possession of the premises. That's a big chunk of the law around here. And I'm not going to stand out here in the dark arguing it out with you. I'll beat it, fella. And take your valises and the dame. You're trespassing. Now, this is a trick to turn me back. Throw arguing with you. Start moving. The next one goes right in your bread basket, fella. And keep going. Mary. Yes, George. Head for the deep shadows and then drop your knees and flatten out quick. I'm sick and tired of being shot at. George, put that gun away. Down, I said. I'm not heading back with my tail between my legs. Oh! Who's I for me? Who was it that said this was a shooting country? He's dead. Oh, gee, I... I just meant to nick him. But you killed him in cold blood. In self-defense. He was planning to tail us down the road and blow us to kingdom come. George, you're making that up. Just as an afterthought. Am I, kid? Who do you suppose took that shot at us driving up here? And that couple found mysteriously dead, the couple old Myers mentioned. Who do you suppose killed them? I want the whole truth. Why were you marked for murder? I said why was a big letter. You got a ditch pocket somewhere. Ditch him. Hide him to protect ourselves, then forget that it ever happened and go about our business. You're not going to the police? No, I'm going about my business, I said. George, what are you afraid of? You've got me confused with the answer, man. I've got to know or I'll lose my mind. Both Ben Myers and Parker thought they recognized you. You have been here before. Never, I swear, never. They, they had me confused with, with somebody else. Play along my way for a while. My way is the only way, Mary. Any other way is no good. I'll get that kerosene lamp and follow along. I'm giving Parker squatters rights to the first big ditch I find. Yeah. He'll stay put now. Oh, come on, kid. Dry your eyes. You've got to take the breaks as they come and play along, for better or for worse. For better or worse. Murder and burial. How far can we get together now? As far as the house, anyhow. That's as far as I want to get. And I don't care how stiff the price is. You get it, Mary? I don't care. <laughs> Right now, set the lamp on that table, Mary. And stop staring at me as if I were some kind of a man-eating monster. You're getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, George. All right, that's better. Look around you. What do you see? The room is a wreck. Check and double check. The paneling's ripped out. The floorboards are up. Someone started taking the fireplace apart brick by brick. <laughs> my property buy doesn't look so good, huh? George. What? What does it mean? Vandals always have a field day with an abandoned property. No, it means something else. 
Check, kid. Parker, hold up here, looking for something. And you're looking for something, too. You're catching on, kid. That's why we're in this forsaken country. That's why you were marked for murder. What are you looking for, George? A couple of things. One of them's a stiff. A fresh-faced kid who called himself Johnny Morrow came out here about two years ago. He was never seen again. Alive. And you know why, Mary? Why? Because he's still here. My kid brother never left this house. Alive or dead. Whoever bricked up this fireplace bricked it up to keep. George, if you find your brother, what then? Then I go right for item number two. The jackpot. The jackpot? Do re me cash. Money piled as high as the Empire State. We parlay the corpse into a fortune. Yeah, that does it. The hole's big enough to drive a truck through. Bring that lamp over. Closer. Closer, you dummy. Yes, George. See what I see? <gasps> Walled in as if he was part of the building layout. Meet your brother-in-law, Mary. Right. Help me drag him out. Yes, George. Set him down over here. When he was a kid, he always came running to me when he got into a jam. It was a year's difference, but we were lookalikes. That's why the old man and Parker thought they'd seen you before. Check. They'd seen Johnny. Who killed your brother? His partner, a hoodlum named Wiley. Johnny and Wiley had pulled a payroll stick up, a $50,000 job. Wiley tried to double-cross Johnny. And Johnny holed up here with the payroll money. Wiley trailed Johnny out here, tortured him for weeks, and then killed him. Why? Why did Wiley torture Johnny? To find out where Johnny had stashed the money. But Johnny never told him. Johnny knew his goose was cooked anyway. How did you find out these things? Johnny smuggled a letter out addressed to me through old Ben Myers. The letter said nothing but said a lot. Small talk, everyday brother stuff, wrapped around two key words. The words were, search me. <laughs> As kids, we used to play treasure hunt with maps we made up and sewed in the lining of our clothes. A dollar gets you a thousand that Johnny has a map sewn in his clothes. Now you don't have to ask why anymore, kid. But, but what? Uh, who was Parker? The man we found here? A crook who hung around with Wally. And all the time that's elapsed, why didn't you come here sooner? I was busy looking for Wiley for two years across the country and back again in South America, Mexico. Wiley was always one jump ahead of me. I caught up with him a month ago in Tampico. You caught up with him? Well, what did you do? I gave him a dose of what he gave Johnny. And then I killed him. <clears throat> Lost a dollar bet, kid. Same trick we had as kids. Yeah, a map inside his coat lining. You can read it? Sure, like the ABC. The dough is buried in a can five steps from the back door to the barn. Ah, the dough is practically in my hand. George, you'll have to give the money back. Back? Huh? And give myself up with it, huh? Yes, if you can find the courage. And tell Johnny he died like a chump for nothing. And tell myself I was just a sentimental sap dogging it after Wiley right into Tampico. And maybe get down on my knees in front of that ditch out there and apologize to Park if I haven't put a slug in him. Out of your mind. Out of my mind if I listen to you. I'll lend a hand. Grab Parker's shotgun and watch for intruders while I dig that can up. And then I'll bury Johnny right on the same spot. Yeah, I'll bury Johnny right where he stashed those 50 G's for his big brother to come and get. Think is the jackpot. Like music, eh, Mary? Listen to it. Now, look. You see the money, Mary? Green as grass. Just as I dreamed of it for two years. Just as Johnny and I dreamed of it as kids. 
Green money, green as grass. <laughs> and nothing under a hundred. Did you ever see a bank loan with nothing under a hundred before, Mary? Did you? No, George. This is I what? can recollect. I need this, son. What? I seen small change. Five dollar bill one. I ain't ever seen a hundred before. What are you doing here, Ben? Rejoicing with you, son. I've been waiting and watching a long time for one of you to find that money. That I knew it was hid somewhere around here. <laughs> and I'm an old man. There ain't much time for me to enjoy my share. How much is your share? I was calculating on a quarter, maybe. And I saw you put Parker away. Right now I'm calculating on, say, half. And what are you calculating on doing with half? I don't know, for sure. Treat myself to something good. Maybe buy myself some more land. What do you say, son? You made yourself a deal, Pop. I'm going to give you all the land you need. You're aiming to kill me. George, no! I got to, Mary. I'm not killing the old man. When you came visiting just now, you committed suicide. <laughs> Get up against that tree and turn around. Maybe if I go back to calculating the quarter... I said you committed suicide. <laughs> I'll bury you with a hundred-dollar bill in your hand so you can treat yourself to something good where you're going. Ready? I said you was a winner, son. Yes, I am a loser. So long, sucker. Oh, 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 oh. oh Mary, you fool. You, you shot me. I had to do it, George. I had to save you from yourself. Silly fool. I was going to make you a queen. No, George. It wouldn't have been that way. After then, you would have had to kill me. You see, no power on earth would make me go your way. And no power on earth would make you go mine. You saved my life, Mom. How can an old idiot ever thank you? By going to the police. My husband has a confession to make. got so she couldn't see the trees for the body. <laughs> you know, until tonight, I thought only Santa Claus came through the fireplace. Well, I guess everybody's doubling up everywhere nowadays. Like George. Mary's bullet left him doubled up. <laughs> Still, that was a good choice of location. The fireplace for a corpse. Sort of, uh, how to keep from growing cold. <laughs> Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Inner Sanctum Mysteries, brought to you right through the summer by Bromo Seltzer. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Tell me, fellow ghouls, did you ever take in the frights after dark? Hmm. I did the other night. Found an odd little street called Nightmare Avenue. Just two blocks long and a scream wide. Begins with a small cemetery and ends with a bigger one. 
There's a freakish sort of shop in the alley. Ideal for those of you that are buying stealers. Its sign reads, Gadgets, Ghosts, and Graveyard Gigaws. It is deep night on the raging ocean. The fog is a thick gray wall and the wind is sharp. A boat tosses drunkenly in the deep, at the mercy of the storm. It's unlighted except for a sputtering naphtha flare. We're aboard the Gypsy Princess. Beside its captain, the notorious Captain Henty. A few feet away, worming deeper in the shelter of the fog, backing away from Captain Henty's gun, is another man. A younger man wearing a first mate cap. Chambers! I order you to come out of that blasted box! You hear me? You murdered what was left of the crew! Gorky, McDonald, Pope, Willoughby, Menaker! Five men, five bullets. <laughs> the sixth bullet is for you, Chamber. And if you murder me, then what? You alone, a madman without food or drink, haunting his own ship. Then what? I'll find Bellows and strangle him. And then claim the princess. Claim my bride. I don't exist, Bellows, or your bride. They just live in your mind. Oh, I am. The princess is real. You know the princess is real. You saw with your own eyes. Did I, Captain? Or was it just a myth? An illusion? You heard her speak. I heard a voice. But it could have been the wind. It was the princess as real as you and me. Listen. Listen. It's her, my bride. Princess, you've come back. Where are you, princess? Out there. In the storm. What's the matter, Captain? Afraid? Afraid of over the side, even into the arms of the princess? It's your love calling me a captain. Your phantom bride. Are you going to turn your back on her? Uh, I, I've got to kill you first. And lose the princess? Uh. I'm coming. I'm coming. Captain Henty, I'd find alive. Delivering its cargo of dead men. Say, wait a minute. How'd you know about Miguel, the navigator, and Jensen? Where'd you get your information from? 
For a man to seek logic after the events on the gypsy princess. That's strangest of all. Yeah. <laughs> after two weeks on this floating insane asylum, I shouldn't get goggle eyed over anything. You boarded the ship at the strait. You know that too, huh? <laughs> right. For years since I was a kid, I'd heard tall stories. Unbelievable whoppers about Captain Henty and the Gypsy Prince. Stuff about a ship being haunted. About a girl. A beautiful vision named Princess after the ship. Who followed the boat wherever it sailed. I wanted to write it all up after seeing it all for myself. Shall I stop? No. Go on. Those tall stories started coming to life a few hours after we put to sea. I was in Captain Henty's quarters going over some papers when Corky came by. Corky handled the business details of the ship like a steward would. Captain Henty? Yes? I was checking over the crew list here. So, Corky? I can't make it add up. McDonald, Coach, Weatherby, Menica, Miguel, Jensen, myself, Chambers here. All signed in okay. Eight men, that's your crew? Eight it is, sir. Up to there. But there's a line signature on the list, but nobody answers to it. What is the ninth name? Fellows. Fellows! Stupid fool! Let the lesson get out! All right, sir. All right, sir. You've you seen a signature before, Captain? Yes, from Cape Hatteras to Singapore. I don't get it. Uh, uh, you will. You will in time. You'll know what it means to sail with Bellows aboard. Who is Bellows? The ship's ghost. The gypsy princess was once his ship before he died. How long ago did Bellows die? Ten years ago. And you think a... A dead man signed the cruelest cat. Aye, and you'll believe it too in time. In time, you too will believe Bellows is aboard the Gypsy Princess. Chambers? Aye, sir. Search the ship from stem to stern. Search the lifeboats, the passageways everywhere. Then do it again and again. Spend every minute you're on this ship searching for Bellows. Understand? I can't find Bellows. Find Bellows or you gypsy princess. That was my first brush with the crazy legend of the gypsy princess. I was to spend the whole voyage looking for a dead man who'd signed the crew register. Bellows was master of this ship once. Everything was fine until they both went tapped over a dream lady who was supposed to be following the ship. And she killed Bellows, got all scot free by pleading self defense, then fought the gypsy princess, and went sailing to find the girl. Bellows, then, is just something in the captain's guilt, in his imagination. Oh, no, sir. It's not all in his imagination. Now, you're sounding as balmy as Henty. You don't believe in the Bellows ghost, do you, Corky? I do, indeed. Just you wait, sir, and you'll know Bellows is somewhere aboard this ship. <laughs> It's Captain Henty on the tube. The haunting's begun, I'll bet my pay. Corky speaking, Captain. Take the wheel at once. But it's Miguel's turn at the wheel, sir. Take the wheel at once. Aye, sir. At once. There's Chambers there. Aye, sir. I'll put him on. He wants you, Mr. Chambers. Chambers speaking, Captain. Turn the ship inside out and stop for nothing, Chambers. Fine fellows, or we won't have a navigator left aboard. We've been off our course, turning in circles with our instruments smashed to bits for an hour. What happened to Miguel? <laughs> I told you, you know Bellows was aboard in time. Bellows caught Miguel at the wheel and killed him. <laughs> who's been asleep in the deep, says the gypsy princess is a gyp. What started as a pleasant ocean junket is becoming a nightmare. A ghost book package. 
The captain goes white as a sheet, and poor Chambers is handed the odd job of trailing the little man who isn't there to his pawn. <laughs> Let's see, where did we stream off, huh? Oh, yes. Miguel, the navigator, had just gone the way of all fish. Miguel was at the boat's wheel, clutching it, and staring out into the ocean with dead eyes. A dead man had been steering our course. How was the fool killed? I can't say, sir. His face looks as if he had seen the devil himself. But there isn't a mark on him. Bellows killed him. I, I hate taking issue with you, sir, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's a, a simpler explanation than a mysterious attack by a ghost. A, a heart attack, perhaps. If an autopsy could be performed... There'll be no autopsy. But we've got to establish... I'll have no interference, Chambers. I've got to take immediate steps so you'll all be dead. Assign Jensen to watch the ship's food stores at once. Our food stores? Mind your duties and ask no questions. Make prompt arrangements to throw Miguel over the side. Without service? Just like that? Just like that. We'll throw Miguel as an offering to the prince. Maybe, maybe she'll reappear. It's been so long since she's appeared. Go on now, make your arrangements. We were a grim lot gathered starboard to watch the dead Miguel dropped over the side. The storm was brewing. There was a blinding fog. Ready, Chambers? All ready, sir. Let him go. Princess, Tim, I gave you Miguel. Now come, wash the blood off his curse ship. The crew backed away like men frightened by the face of insanity. And then, over the sound of the ocean, we heard her. Princess! Was a woman's voice, or was it the wind? I watched, spellbound, my eyes burning into the mist that swirled around Captain Henty. I saw... I saw her. Beautiful. The most complete illusion of beauty the mind can imagine. Beautiful beyond words or language. Seeing her, I could understand what drove Captain Henty. And seeing her at Captain Henty's side, I knew scorching jealousy. Chambers, I sir. My bride has come. You see her, don't you? I sir. She's very beautiful. Chambers, marry us here now. But it... Do I have such authority? As captain of the ship, I give you the authority. You'll find my service book in my quarters. I sir. Corky... Hi, Mr. Chambers. Go. Oh, fetch the book of services from the captain's quarters so we can get on with the ceremony. With a crew standing bareheaded and looking on like men bewitched, I married Captain Henty to his vision. <laughs> I quoted such lines as, let no man put asunder, and until death do you parted, a madman standing alone with a mist curling around him. The captain said, I do. And the wind answered for her. The captain had his bride at last, but not for long. After that brief visit, we no longer saw her, even fancy we saw her. The captain sat looking out to sea for hours, days, like a man whose bride had forsaken him right after the wedding. Days passed. And then, bellows struck again. I was with the captain going over some charts when the door opened. It was Corky. His face was strained and frightened. Captain Enzi. What is it, Corky? The food stores. What about them? They're gone. Our food and our water, it's all disappeared. Jensen was assigned to watch the food stores. Send the phone to me. I, I can't. Jensen got what Miguel got. 
We can put into the nearest port. If you look at the charts, we're just a two-day sail from Windcastle. <laughs> it's the only thing to do. With our food or drink, how can we go on? And with our fuel? Fuel? Without coal? How can we go anywhere? I don't get it. Then go down to the engine room and see for yourself. Our coal. Every blasted scrap of it was pirated by fellows last night. The men lay in the hatch dying of thirst to no food. Captain Henty was a complete madman now, with every pretense to sanity falling. He prowled through them like a wild animal, with me behind him watching. Then last night in the pitch dark, I watched him climb to the lookout tower. Corky was up there waving a naphtha flare in the last desperate SOS. I watched the captain come up behind Corky and circle his arms around Corky's neck. Help! 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 I hurried to the and pulled the captain away. Let him go, Hendy! Chairman, this is the last time you'll interfere. Go ahead, issue the order. There isn't a man aboard who has the strength but to carry it out. I know you exactly for what you are now, Captain. I know about those murders and the disappeared stores. You! You did all of it! You're the ghost haunting your own ship! How? You think I did it all? I'm sure of it. You're a madman with your guilt about killing bellows. Your hallucinations about a woman following your ship. You're the curse over the gypsy princess! You and you alone! So that's what you've come to believe. You fool. That's what Bellows wants you and everybody to believe. I saw you try to kill Corky just now. No, ghost. You in the flesh. I had to kill Corky. I have to kill you all. Those are my sailing orders. What? Crazy talk is that now? I am to deliver a cargo of dead men. And I mustn't fail or I'll lose the princess, fella. Stand back, Chambers. Don't move. I've got six bullets in this gun, including you, Chambers. The crew is exactly six now. You see, I mustn't waste a single bullet. You're going to shoot us in cold blood. Just because of some insane obsession. I must. We'll all be dead soon if you just wait. No, no, no. I can't risk it that way. I, Captain Henty of the Gypsy Princess, must personally deliver a cargo of dead men. One bullet for Corky. No! Save us! And he shot the other four. Then came after me with his last bullet. He went over the side when his phantom bride called. <laughs> I blabbed about everything. Just the bar. I knew the story. All of the story. You... You said you'd heard shots and rode over here when you came aboard. I did say that. But I don't see your rowboat. And your clothes aren't even damp. You were never out there in a small boat for a minute. Wasn't I? No. If you're open up and talk, who are you? She'll tell you who I am. She? The princess. See her? No. Look again with your heart. See her now. <laughs> yeah. She's beautiful. Thanks, Seth. Your bell. What do you think? Oh. I don't know. I'm delirious, I guess. You belong to me now, princess. Empty. Lost you back to me. (laughs) 
I watched to float in with the mist. And the same indescribable pleasure and indescribable pain I'd seen on Captain Henty's face flushed all through me. I was in love with him. And burning up with jealousy. <laughs> I was dying of thirst, dying of hunger, too weak to even raise a finger, but I went to Bellows. I didn't want him to have the princess. Bellows! Bellows, I'm going to kill you! Do you hear me, Bellows? There's no one here. <laughs> Just me and the cargo of death in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I imagine how much of it all did I... Imagine what's real? Wow, oh, what a fish story. I don't know what it did to you, Brother Whale, but it's got me scaled down to size. It's the old block for me from now on. There's less terror in terra firma. Dry land to you, Bob. I say, if you must get the nautical urge, compromise by diving into the bathtub, huh? And if a strange hand passes you the wash rag and soap, don't take it. Ignore it. Stay underwater and play. Time to close that squeaking door for another seven-day rest. Until next week at this time, when Bromo Seltzer brings you another Inner Sanctum Mystery, directed by Hyman Brown. Well, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is Report for a Court by Henry Kane. Next week, you'll hear our answer to the housing shortage. Because we've got a story about a little home in the country that'll kill you. And anybody else who enters. It's called The House of Doom. And behind its walls, some of the most charmingly gruesome people you ever met will die and haunt and howl and murder to your heart's content. So be sure to listen, won't you? Until next Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, friends and fellow ghouls. This is your host inviting you through the squeaking door of the inner sanctum for another delightful visit with creatures you'd hate to meet on land or sea or in dark alleys. <laughs> well, friends, now the summer romance is flourishing. This young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of lovely murder. <laughs> the reason for that is because I have a one-pack mind. I can think of the nastiest things in the balmiest weather. When I see the first tender flower buds open their delicate petals, I immediately think how nice they look on some murderous grave. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, House of Doom, was written by Milton Lewis and stars Santos Ortega in the role of Mark with Charlotte Holland as Lorraine. All right, friends. Turn out the lights. Lie down on your slab. I mean your sofa. And get ready to scream for joy as we hear a terrifying story that could happen to anyone. 
Who's a murderer? Ready now. Hold tight and listen. People in that section of New England call the little peninsula David Jones's hand because the sharp and jagged rocks formed a murderous angry fist thrust out into an everlastingly angry sea. There was only one house on David Jones's hand. Mark Douglas lived there with his second wife, Lorraine. And folks whispered that something had happened to Mark and that despite his wealth, he couldn't cure a mind that was gradually losing its reason. The rain. Look at that storm. The rain is beating down like bullets. The wind is roaring like a monster. <gasps> Did you hear someone scream? No, Ma. Are you quite certain? Yes, Ma. Well, you still want to go out? I promised Mrs. Daly I'd come. It's just down the road. Really? And what's so important about you going? Oh, Mark, I, I just want to see her. We, we were going to play a little bridge. Now, Mark, why don't you come in here? No. Why not? You've locked yourself in this house like a prisoner for months. You can't go on like this. I don't want to go with you, and that's the end of it. Then why do you object to my going? I don't want to be here alone. I I can't bear it when I'm alone. I, there. I'm positive I heard someone scream. No. Yes, I did. It was a woman. A woman screaming for help. Didn't you hear it? No, Ma. No? Please, I want to go now. Lorraine, I'm afraid to let you go. Afraid? Why? I'm afraid something might happen to you. Well, what could possibly happen? The, the same thing that happened to, to Betty. Betty, your first wife. Mm -hmm. She... She went out on a night like this. Alone. Down that rocky road. And the next morning, I found her body on the beach, covered with seaweed. Like some horrible thing that had been chewed, mauled, and spit up by a murderous sea. I can't see her another minute. I've got to get out. You'll do what I tell you. No. You will. Florence. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Forgive you. Shall I forgive you for the months you've kept me locked up here? Waiting on you and listening to you, Lorraine. Get me this, Lorraine. Get me that, Lorraine. I hear screams, Lorraine. I'm afraid. And I have been fighting it. Well, I can't bear it. I'm leaving. Lorraine. Come back, Lorraine. I'll be all right. I'll be all right without her. Oh, Oh. Just the wind. It's Betty. Help me, Mark. Betty, where are you? Help! Betty, where are you? Tell me, tell me. Can I hear it? What's happening to me? Where's the phone? I must be hearing things. Hello? Is that you, Richard? Yes. This is Mark. Mark Douglas. Uh, a bit under the weather. Well, I don't blame you on a night like this. I, I'm here all alone, Richard. Where's Lorraine? She went to Mrs. Daly's place. This may seem kind of silly to you, but would you please come over? Now? Yes, now, right away. As soon as you can get here. What's wrong? Well, nothing. Nothing really, but... Richard, I can't stay here alone. <laughs> Did you hear something? What? A woman. A woman screaming for help. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. You wouldn't hear it over the telephone. What are you talking about? These screams. These screams I keep hearing. It's been going on for months. I think it's Betty. Richard, you've got to come over right away. I can't be here alone. I can't. What is it, Mark? What's wrong? She's at the door. Oh. The woman. Goodbye, Richard. forward and touched me. And then something snapped in my brain. What? What happened to me, Lorraine? You fainted, Mark. That's all. 
I know. Yes, he must have received a bad shock of some sort. Look at those screams. Look, he's standing at the door. You must have imagined it, Mark. You're not well. Imagined it. She was standing right there. What's the matter, Mark? Look. Look there on the floor. It seems. She's yes. come back to torment me. To talk to me, to kill me, possibly. Mark, yes. what are you saying? Now, look, you've got to leave this house. That's what's doing it, this horrid, hideous old house. Lorraine, do you love me? Really? Do you think I could have stayed here these last few months if I didn't love you? Maybe. Maybe if I tell you, it'll be easier to bear. Maybe if I tell you, you might find some way out. What will be easier to bear? In my desk drawer, there's a flashlight. Hmm? Get it. All right, but what are you trying to tell me? You'll know in a moment. I have the flashlight. Now, go to the stairs. Hmm? No, no, there. Next to the picture. But why? There's something I must show you. You know, everyone believed my first wife died by accident or suicide. She was a very excitable, neurotic girl. No one, except you, Lorraine, knows that she was murdered. Murdered? Yes. By me. It was carefully planned. I wanted the money and I... Lorraine, you can't betray me. Do you think I ever would? No. Put your hand on the post. Hmm? Underneath the banister. The fourth one. That's the one. Now twist it. Go on, twist! To your right. All right. There. You see? It's a trap door. It's built into the floor. But why? Turn the flashlight down there. Huh? Go on, turn it into that blackness. I don't want it. Yes. Can you see those rocks? She fell down there when I sprung the trap. Struck her head against those rocks. When the tide changed, washed her body out of that subterranean cabin into the sea. And then washed it up on the beach. And now do you understand why I can never leave this house? Close it, that door! Close it! How, Mark? Put the post to the left. Yes. Now. Now. How did you find out about this door, Mark? I discovered it when I examined the house years ago. It was empty then. It had been empty for years. And you chose it because of the door? Yes. But I've gotten to hate it. Mm-hmm. I've gotten to hate every board, every window, every sound. I know I'm going to die here in the sea and she's going to kill me. She's going to murder me for what? Mm-hmm. Lorraine, take your hand off that post. Don't! Quick, right dirty, right in the trap door! <laughs> I received a phone call from Mark tonight, and I... Lorraine. You look so strange. Do I, Richard? And so... So beautiful. Oh, no, no. No, you mustn't, Richard. Not now. Where's Mark? Well, that, that just it. I, I don't know. I went out to Mrs. Daly's, and, and then I changed my mind. And, and when I returned, he was gone. I'm, I'm worried, Richard. What did he tell you on the phone? He sounded absolutely out of his mind. Completely hysterical. Complained of hearing screams. In a terrible state. Lorraine, do you think that he could Yes, that's that's what I'm worried about, those clips. It may not be too late. We'd better search for him. Yes, I'll come with you. Lorraine, I think you'd better go home. No, Richard. You've been up all night. Police and the Coast Guard are searching for him. I don't see how it could do any good for us to search these beaches. Mark may be here somewhere. Oh, well, we'll find him. Hello! Hello there! Why, the fisherman down the beach there. I think he's found something. Hello! Hello there! We're coming! Look, you look on the rocks near him. Yes, perhaps... I can't see it very well in the mist. Oh, yeah, yeah. I found a body. Where is it? Here. Right there. 
Just over there, stumbled across him. Oh, uh, who's with him? A woman? Yes. Is it my husband? Oh, I didn't know it was you, Mrs. Douglas. Here in the mist. Uh, you'd better not go. I will. We should take away the seaweed so I can see his face. Richard. If you won't, I will. How'd you like to live in the house of doom? Hmm? Cozy little place to spend a short life, but a loony one, isn't it? You know, a little home like that would be our answer for housing shortage. Just build a few of them and you won't have any tenants to worry about. <laughs> well, friends, let's get back to our story. Two years after the death of her husband, we find the lovely Lorraine and the house on Davy Jones's hand. Staring out the window, just as her husband had done on the night he was murdered. She's married again to her husband's friend, Richard Belmont. Are you ready, Lorraine? Yes, Richard. Will you help me with my raincoat, please? Go ahead. Right. Thank you. Will Kathy be there? Oh, I don't know. I suppose they asked her. At any rate, they'll all be glad to see you. Why, this will be the first time you've stepped out of the house in months. I can't help it if I've been ill. Lorraine, there's no reason to get angry. I'm sorry. It's just that I, I don't care to go out in a storm like that. Just a short trip down the road. I know it. Well, it's a little rain. You're in very good health now. Please don't talk about it. Okay. You ready? Yes, I'm quite ready. Thank you. Let's go. I can't go. All right. Richard, please close that door. I'm coming here. What's the matter with you? Nothing. I, I just don't want to leave here tonight, that's all. I was afraid of this. Were you? There's something weird. Something queer about the way you cling to this house. Though it held you trapped. Mark was that way before he died, too. Please don't talk about Mark. Why not? What are you afraid of? Nothing. Nothing except to leave this house. Nothing except that you jump at every sound. You think I don't notice things? You think I'm a fool? Where are you going? Out. If you won't come with me, I'll go alone. I can't stand this place another moment. No. I've been locked up in here for days. I feel like a trapped animal. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Richard. Don't go. Why not? Because I'm asking you not to. Richard, please stay with me. I don't want to be in this house alone. Please stay. I hear things when I'm in this house alone. But you don't leave me. Your life may, be, may depend on the Please, please, Richard, don't go. Goodbye. Richard! Richard! Hello? Hello. Is that you, Kathy? Yes. This is Lorraine Belmont. Oh. Kathy, what are you doing tonight? Oh, just listening to some records. Why? Well, I... Uh, I'm here all alone. Well, where's Richard? He went out. Kathy, I want you to come right over. On a night like this? Take the car. Come right away. Well, what's wrong? Well, there, there's, there's something I want to talk to you about. Oh, but really, Lorraine, can't it wait? No. But, Lorraine... Are you refusing to come here because you expect a visit from Richard? Really? What are you talking about? I think you know quite well. <laughs> Did you hear that? What? His voice calling my name. It sounded like Mark. Mark? But Mark's dead. I'm well aware of that. That's why it couldn't be Mark, could it? What are you going to say? Oh, oh. 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 Did you hear it? No. I didn't hear anything. There's someone at the door. Will you hold on to me, please? Bye, Kathy. Hello, Lorraine. Richard. I just 
decided to come back, I couldn't leave you alone. I'm sorry. Quite all right. Do you have there? Look at it. Seaweed. Where did it come from? I found it outside the door. That's odd. Yes. And what's odder is that someone knocked at the door and left the field. Now, Lorraine, you haven't been having those hallucinations again. But they're not hallucinations, Richard. I heard someone call my name. Now, Lorraine. Please, Richard. Don't come near me. Stand over there. That's where you are. Very well. But, uh, why are you standing there, holding the post? You shall know, presently. Do you think you deceived me, Richard? What are you talking about? About Cassie. You're in love with her. That's nonsense. You would like to have my money and Cassie, wouldn't you, Richard? That's why you've been playing these tricks on me. What tricks? Calling my name, leaving the seaweed out there. Why should I want to do that? To make me confess. Confess what? That I murdered Mark. You? You murdered Mark? Yes. How did you first find out, Richard? Did you hear me call out in my sleep as I heard Mark do? Yes. Mm-hmm. That's how I learned that Mark murdered his first wife. It's very difficult to keep a murder a secret. The strange satisfaction in being able to confess it. Why are you telling me this now? Because you wanted to know. That's why you played these horrid little tricks on me. What makes you think I played tricks, Lorraine? Because I played... Yes. Even to using the seaweed. How could you have murdered Mark? I was waiting for you to ask me. He was a powerful man. You couldn't have pushed him off those cliffs. No, I couldn't have. And you were never out there with him? No. But everyone knew he was mentally ill. Everyone suspected suicide. Yes, and how very convenient. How could you have killed him? I'll show you, Richard. Since you're so anxious to know. Don't move. Richard, why did you leap away? I see it now. The rocks and the sea down there. You would have killed me if I hadn't leaped away in time. Come here, Lorraine. No. No, Richard, let go of me. There must be a subterranean passage no. down there, and the body gets washed out to sea. That's why you never left this house. You were afraid someone would discover your secret. Richard, what are you going to do? What do you expect? No, and no. And why shouldn't I? You did it to Mark for his money. If it'll be any satisfaction to you, Lorraine, that's exactly why I'm holding you here now for precisely the same reason, your money. And since you take so much pride in being right, Lorraine, I'll tell you one more thing. You were quite right about Kathy and my said you weren't home. Did she? Well, she called up frantically on the phone. I swear she sounded half insane. Where is she? Why, she isn't here, Kathy. I came back from the dailies. In fact, I never got there. When I returned a moment ago, she was gone. Richard, do you think... I don't know. A woman in her mental condition is very apt to destroy herself. Destroy herself? Then you'll be free... And you and I... We mustn't think of that now, Kathy. She may still be out there somewhere. We've got to try to save her. If we can. Come on, let's look for her. <laughs> Kathy, you can't leave this house tonight. Not in a storm like this. Why not, Richard? It was on a night like this that Lorraine was killed three years ago. I was afraid to let you go out. You're my wife, and I love you, and... You mustn't leave me alone. I can't stand this house another moment. Locked up with you here night and day for months. I can't leave, Kathy. You must stay. I can't bear it here alone. I'm going. Where? To see some man? Is that what you're going? Some man? That must be another of your hallucinations. I'm just going down the road. I've got to see some human being who's in his right mind or I'll go out of my mind myself. Kathy, don't leave him. Did you hear it then? Hear what, Richard? That voice. A woman's voice. Calling for help. No, Richard, I... I didn't hear a thing. Are you sure? Yes. Kathy, don't go. Stay with me. No. I can't stay here another minute in this place. 
who invented the torture, the evil, and the doom that couldn't be worse. No. I, I hate every board, every door, every piece of it. I can't stand another instant. Goodbye, Richard. Kathy! Kathy! I... I wonder... Does she know? Have I been talking in my sleep? Hmm. Maybe I should tell her. I'm sure I could trust her. and Kathy aren't going to go down that trap door, then you just don't have any imagination. Or you just haven't heard enough in a tangle of mystery. <laughs> of course, we have a very uplifting moral for these gruesome shenanigans. It's taken from the haunted words of Poltergeist, who said, Always live in a house that's haunted by ghosts, vampires, werewolves, zombies, and spooks. You'll never have a dull night. <laughs> Inner Sanctum was heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and has been rebroadcast for servicemen and women overseas through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, you on the other side of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum. <laughs> well, you may as well relax. Wipe the perspiration off your brow and listen. As the lads who dump their victim into his own icebox remark, we'll chill you. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Death Rides a Riptide, was written by Lou Vittis and stars Arlene Blackburn in the role of Carol with Lawson Zerby as John. Tonight, we're featuring a jovial little item about a girl named Carol Vane. She married a man whose first wife had been drowned. After a little while, she discovered that she herself was in hot water over her hair. It's the night that John Vane has brought his new bride home. Home to the cliff house above the ocean. Well, Carol? This house is very beautiful, John. Yes, it is. A bit lonely, perhaps. I could never be lonely with you. Oh, darling. <laughs> Let's go in. All right, dear. Mmm, a bit musty. <laughs> we'll get the place aired, though, first thing in the morning. How does it get this way after they've been shut up for a while? Of course they do. Oh, uh, the place hasn't been opened since... Since... Since Margaret died, John? Yes. John, you mustn't be self-conscious about it. Well, it wasn't very tactful, my mentioning her. I... John, I love you. Tact doesn't belong. I'm sorry. Darling, the hour's late and your husband... <laughs> what? John! It's, it's all right. 
to someone with a very bad sense of humor, throwing stones. That wasn't supposed to be funny. John, you, you've got the stone. Yes. There's something wrapped around it. Paper. Let me see it. No, no. Please, it John. Well, I don't imagine I could keep it from you indefinitely. Keep what from me? Here's the stone. Well, the paper. It's a note addressed to me, John. It would be. It says, to the new Mrs. Vane. If you listen carefully, you can hear the waves beating against the cliff. The waves in which the first Mrs. Vane died. Did she fall? Or was she pushed? Listen. It... It isn't signed, John. No. You can hear the waves. I... Oh, I'm that sorry. Uh, that's silly. But the, the note was so nasty. You're not to pay any attention to things like that note. You're not to pay any attention. I won't, John. I won't. Can we go to sleep now? Of course. It, it's true that Margaret was drowned, but it, it was an accident, wasn't it? Wasn't it, John? John fell asleep after a while, and the waves kept pounding against the rocks. I remembered having heard how badly she'd been bruised by the rocks. I remembered seeing her and John in the village, and how beautiful she'd been, and how I'd envied her. And now, now after the waves and the rocks, she didn't care anymore. And before I could fall asleep, I envied her even now. Well, that was a very fine dinner, darling. John. Yes? Exactly how did... did Margaret die? Carol, there's no I point... I want to know. She was drowned. She was a good swimmer. Even good swimmers get drowned. What happened, John? I think you'd be wiser if you'd forget about Mark. All right. There's a beach below Cliff House. It's there at low tide only. A beach and a ledge. Nice place to swim from the ledge at low tide. But when the tide comes in, beach and ledge are, are covered. The tide's strong then, and there are rocks around. Margaret got caught by high tide. That's all. You mean she stayed down below on the ledge longer than she should have? That's right. And, and that's all, John? What else should there be? I don't know. It's low tide now, isn't it? Yes. I'd like to look at that ledge. Why? Oh, because I'm silly. Because I'm a fool, but... John, I want to look at that ledge. There are steps leading down, aren't there? Yes, I had them built some years ago. Carol, we should go back to the house. This business is idiotic, morbid. But we're at the ledge now. The tide's down. The ledge is it's broad and safe, isn't it? It is. At high tide, I suppose it would be covered. Yes. Cracks in the ledge. Seaweed caught in the cracks. From the time the ledge is covered by the water, I guess. And... And... What is it? This was wedged in one of the cracks. This... Oh. Yes, John. It's part of a heel. A woman's high heel. So it is. Oh, the, the tide's rising. Let's go up. All right. Part of a woman's high heel. Caught in one of the cracks. John. Yes? Could it be from Margaret's shoe? I couldn't tell. Throw it away, or, or better yet, give it to me. Yes, of course. Here. Thank you. John. A woman who's going swimming. She. She wouldn't have been wearing high heels. We didn't speak on the way back from the ledge. And once back at the house, John found it stuffy or something, I suppose. He muttered at me and went out into the night. The night that had become so suddenly. 
of so intense a darkness. I... John? Oh, wait, wait, I'm coming. Who, who is it? You, you startled me, my dear. Appearing there in the doorway, you know, for a moment I thought you were my niece. Your niece? Yes. You're not, of course. My niece is dead. Who are you? Jeremy Mangan, my dear. Mangan? Mangan? Your predecessor, my dear, was named Margaret. Her... Her father? Uncle. May I come in? For an elderly gentleman like myself, the night is cold. It's cold for me, too. Come in. Thank you. Where is dear John? He's out. Oh, it's too bad. I did want to see him. What about? Money. I hope I don't shock you by my frankness. He owes you money? No, but I think he'll give me some. Why? You're a crying little creature, aren't you? Why do you think John will give you money? My dear, I intend to sell John a letter. Tell him a letter. A letter written to me by my dearly beloved niece. Uh, Margaret. But why should John want to buy it? Let me read you a bit of it, shall I? All right. She says in the letter, among other things... Ah, uh, uh, yes. Uncle, come for me. At once. I must get away from Cliff House. Because if I don't, I'm going to die. I'm afraid. Please don't think I'm making this up, but I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. Well, I rather think that's enough, don't you? Why didn't you come in answer to a letter? She sent the letter out two months ago. Two months ago, I happened to be detained elsewhere. To be precise, I was momentarily in jail. I didn't get the letter which had been sent to my lodgings until this week. Tragic. Hmm? John has nothing to be afraid of, whatever the letter says. My dear, I never suggested he had. But I still feel he'll buy my letter from me. For old time's sake. How much? A couple of thousand will be enough. I'm not a grasping man. If you saw John, spoke to him as you've spoken to me, he'd kill you. A habit of his? I'll get you the 2000 Give me the letter. Ah, uh, I'd be, my dear. Not that I don't trust you. Well, then? I'll be at the hotel in the village. Shall we say tomorrow afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon. Good night, my dear. Oh, it, uh, it occurs to me. Am I likely to run into John? I don't know where he is. Hmm. Oh, well, the night is dark, I dare say I'll manage. I did mention cash, didn't I? But, uh... Maybe. This my soul. You startled me. Standing there at the edge of the cliff, I... Now be careful. My mind, I... It's devil... I won't go over the cliff. No, no, no. Ah! Well, here we are, back again with Carol Vane, who married John Vane after his first wife had been drowned. Officially, it was an accident, but a lot of people feel that John believed in the old saying, cast your dead upon the water. <laughs> At any rate, late one night, the drowned woman's uncle, a man named Mangan, visited Carol. He had a letter from the first Mrs. Vane in which she wrote of her impending murder. Carol agreed to meet Mr. Mangan the next afternoon with some money. But long before then, somebody heaved Mr. Mangan over the edge of a cliff. Maybe for exercise? At any rate, it's the next morning at breakfast. Carol. Yes, John? 
You're upset about something. No, I'm not. Not really. John, when you went out last night, where did you go? For a walk. Why? Nothing. What's in the papers this morning? Oh, same old stuff. International crises. And... Hmm. John? Look at something else. Mangan, Margaret's uncle, Carol. Yes? What about him? It seems he fell off a cliff last night. Oh, John. He was wandering about in the dark. Was it near here? Oddly enough, yes. And they found his body this morning. John, did you... Did you see him last night? No, I haven't seen him for months. Why do you suppose he came here? I've no idea. Wait. Where is he now? Probably at the morgue. What they call the morgue. Benny's drugstore in the village. I... I think we should go down there. Why? Well, you, you knew him. He, he was your wife's uncle. I never liked him. Still, it would look better. Carol, what are you thinking? How his death... His... Accidental death... Fits. <laughs> He was lying on a table in the back of Fenny's drugstore. The fall hadn't marked him much. Nobody had gone through his things yet. So while Fenny and John and I stared at the dead body, I, I gasped. Carol. Oh, I, oh, I feel faint. Huh? Mr. Fenny, could, could you get me something? Uh, of course, Mom. Be back in a minute. Oh. Oh. oh, John. Oh, I just remembered. Tell Mr. Fenny not to get ammonia. I, I, I can't... Take it. But, well, all right. Uh, Mr. Fanny, could you be sure to get something? I loved my husband. So I went over to where the dead body lay and put my hands in his pocket. And I found the letter. Carol, he fixed something. Here. Oh, thanks, John. Your wife. Shaking. Oh, well, maybe this stuff will help us. Feel any better? A little. If we can leave now. Of course. Carol. Yes? What did you take from Mangan's dead body? I told him nothing. I lied. Later that evening, he went upstairs. There was a fire burning in the fireplace, and I, I threw the letter in. Carol, I'm... what's that? What? In the fireplace, that paper. Oh, nothing. Just, just wait. I think I'll take a look at it before it John, turns. please don't. Carol, let go. No, John, I love you. I don't care. No, I want to get that paper. I don't want to hurt you. But oh, I no. must get oh. it. Oh, it's all burned, John. All but a tiny piece. A tiny piece of paper. The end of a letter. Signed, Margaret. A letter from my wife. My dead wife. I... I didn't want you to see it. Why? Because... Because in it she wrote silly things. What kind of silly things? I, I don't remember, John. You got the letter from Mangan after he was dead. How did you know he had the letter, Carol? I... I didn't know. You got rid of Fenny and me so you could get at Mangan. Carol, how did you know Mangan had a letter from my... From Margaret? He told me. Then he was here before he, he fell. Yes, John. Did he tell you what was in the letter? No. Did you read the letter before you burned no. it? No. Then why did you burn it? Because, oh, because I was jealous. I still am. I have everything to do with Margaret. You loved her before you loved me. You're telling me the truth, Carol? Why should I lie about it, John? Why? It wasn't very good after that. John took to staying away from home. I saw very little of him. We avoided each other. Each of us for reasons we didn't dare speak of. It wasn't very good there in the cliff house above the ocean. The ocean where Margaret Vane had died. And where Mangan had fallen to his death. I might have gone away. That would have been the safest thing of all for me, but... But I loved John. And I hoped. And in hoping, I was betrayed... John? Yes, my beloved John. Oh, I'm glad you're home, even though... Even though the hour is too late to be respectable? Oh, I, I don't care. There's a lot you don't care about, isn't there? I don't know what you... You put on quite an act, don't you? About not knowing. But you do know, don't you? I do know what? That my wife, uh, excuse me, my first wife, was murdered. John. Yes, it's out it... now. 
It's been said now. Margaret was murdered. They don't have to whisper about it in the village anymore. I'll shout it out. I won't listen to you. You think that'll make it right, huh? It won't, my love. Because you see, the fishing boat Evangeline is back. Fishing boat? It's been away for three months. The men on board didn't know about Margaret's death. They know now, and a couple of them remember something. What do they remember? Seeing Margaret on the ledge just before the tide turned. But it's... The trouble is, they're prepared to swear that Margaret wasn't alone. John, that doesn't have to mean anything. Look at me, John. It doesn't mean anything. Carol, what was in that letter you burned? I didn't read it. I... John, you're hurting me. What was in that letter you burned? Oh, let me go. I'll tell you. Thank you. Margaret was afraid... Was afraid she was going to be murdered. Yes. I rather thought so. That was why Mangan had to die. John, I'm leaving. No, you're staying. Here with me. You're the only wife I have left now. You're insane. Am I? That's a thought. Hadn't occurred to me before. I'll think about I it. I won't stay. Why not? I'm, I'm afraid. Are you? Get away from my desk. No. You keep a gun here. Yes, I have it now. You wouldn't shoot me. You love me. I do, John. But it's no good anymore. I'm going away. You're mistaken. Don't come any closer to me. You're not going away. You're never going away, Carol. John, if you take another step, I'll... I'll... You what, my precious? Oh. You... you did shoot after all. Somehow. I didn't think you would. I... I told you not to come any closer to me. I underestimated you. I've always underestimated you. But, Carol, when I die, and I am going to die, what will you tell the police? What I have to tell them. That I shot you in self-defense. Yes. Yes, of course, that would be your lie. Not a bad one. It might have worked. It's the truth. Of course it is. But, Carol, defending yourself against a murder charge isn't considered good motive for acquittal. What do you mean? I would have bought Mangan off because I was in love with you. Even though I knew. But Mangan was murdered anyway. By you. Very consistent story. But, Carol, you remember that shoe heel? Yes. High heel? Woman's shoe? You know where it is now? No. On the, on the ledge, down below, in the crack where it was before. And the police are going to examine that ledge once again. Now they've heard the story of the fishing boat people. It has nothing to do with me. Carol, Margaret never wore high heels. Never. Something wrong with her feet. So the heel has to be. To be yours. My. My beloved. Murderess. Uh, uh, John. John. Dead. Dead as Mangan. Dead as Margaret. And I. I. There was the ledge and the broken heel in the crack. A little item of unfinished business that I had to finish. Mangan was dead and the letter burned. I was safe there. John was dead and his knowledge dead with him. I was safe there. The men on the fishing boat hadn't seen the second figure on the ledge clearly enough to identify. I was safe there. There remained only the heel broken off one of my shoes when I hit Margaret. And I'd get it before the police did. And I'd be safe there. The tide's coming in. The ledge is still above water. The ledge where my heel had been. But the heel... The heel wasn't there. Maybe I mistook the place. The ledge is broad. I began to hunt over it. There isn't too much time. The tide's coming in. The rip tide that had battered Margaret against the rock. The heel was down there someplace and I had to find it. To find it, I couldn't. And the waves began breaking over the ledge. But it began creeping over its surface. And the shoe heel that would hang me. That would hang me wasn't there. But now I realize. So 
Leon had lied. Theo wasn't on the ledge at all. I must run. Escape. Run. But the waves are higher now. The ledge is covered with water. I turned to run. And I fell. I fell. And Carol Vane, fundamentally a nice girl with a slight character defect. She killed people. Of course, her reasons were the finest. She only wanted to get married. Unfortunately, she never learned the old proverb. As you make your dead, so you must lie about it. She tried, but she was tripped by a heel. <laughs> Incidentally, if you happen to be out fishing one of these fine evenings and the tide's going out, say hello to Carol. Mm. <laughs> we invite you to join us again next week at this time for Inner Sanctum. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Chills creeping up your spine. Stay tuned for more spine tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares, live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host, bidding you enter the inner sanctum. Come in, come in. And now for tonight's tortured tantrum. Ever have an ancestor who's dead but won't lie down? Hmm. Can't happen, huh? Okay, bub, hang on and we'll demonstrate. We're in an ancient cemetery hidden in a lost valley somewhere outside an old New England town. The stone face of a mausoleum reads 1790. Behind its iron door, the ancient dead sleep in sealed vaults. Beside the dead, trapped in the mausoleum, is a man. He's haggard, glassy-eyed, like a man suspended between life and death. The man rallies his dying energies to tear at the door. To break his hand in a final desperate attempt at escape. I gotta get out. I gotta get out of the fortune's not good. It's not good. Thank you. Thank you. You can't let me die. Don't let me die. The rest of it's yours. Go drink it all of it. Take it for yourself, only stop, stop. So I looked at the hand, broke without a dime in the world. Exactly the way I began. Exactly the way I began. So six weeks ago, I came to this jerkwater town of Hillcrest to claim a worthless white elephant. The state called Highgate. It's been in my family since the Battle of Bunker Hill. I was the missing heir. But finding me cost the trustees more money than the estate was worth. Mm, that's the picture, Mr. Lyon. The big estate, but the land's been neglected too long, and the buildings are about ready to fall down. Now, if the inheritance raised your hopes any, I'm well, sorry. What about cash, other property, stocks, maybe? No, the tax collector sees what little there was for arrears. There isn't a cash penny in sight for a young fella, unless you... 
Well, unless you chance to run into your grandfather's boodle. My great-grandfather? Yep, your great-grandfather, Daniel Zanga. Folks around here say old Daniel salted a pile away and walks the halls of Highgate watching it and waiting for the right descendants to come along. Wait a minute, you're talking over my head. Well, I'm just repeating local bogeyman talk. <laughs> See, according to old records here in Hillcrest, your great-grandfather was a man of fearful omens and prophecies. You're not saying he had supernatural powers. Well, the records hint he had. There's a paper in the files that accuses old Daniel Zenger of consorting with the devil. And there's another paper ordering his execution for the same thing. My great-grandfather was put to death? It's weird to believe the records, yes. What did you mean by that remark, waiting for the right descendant to come along? Oh, legend. The old Daniel Zenger swore his money would keep until an avenging descendant came along. <laughs> But don't you get, go get no ideas, young fella. <laughs> now, uh, now, if there's anything I can do for you... Yeah, there is. Run the missing air 20 bucks, huh? I'll need train fare out of here. A train out of Hillcrest would have been the smart play. But curiosity got the better of me. I wanted to see Highgate once. I'm just out of town... I hitchhiked part of the way, and I hooked it the rest of the way with the storm threatening. Highgate was more run down than could describe. I stood outside, watching the shadows pile around that big heap of junk. It had a look about it, as if... as if once it pulled you in, you were shut away forever. Before I knew it, I was heading inside, as if I couldn't help myself. But it wasn't pulling... I was being pushed in, as if there were someone at my back. I was inside, and the door banged shut. It was the wind, I told myself. The door had been opened, and the wind had blown it closed. But I had a feeling that I wasn't alone. I felt a presence near me, pushing me, with a sputtering yellow light in a square library room. No. Who? Who are you? Jay Walters. You wouldn't be Theodore Zinger then. I'm Ted Lyon. What are you doing here? At the moment, making notes. I'm the town librarian. What are those books you got there? The remnants of Daniel Zinger's personal library. There are many fascinating writings here. My great-grandfather's writings, you said? Yes. In addition to his other... Uh, Reputed talents. Daniel Zenger was a prolific penman. What do the manuscripts say? I can't tell as yet. The language is English, but much of it is in an old, obscure dialect. I would need to examine and interpret them. That is, if you have no objection. No, I haven't. Uh, you can make a bundle of the stuff, take it along with you, and dope out what it says on one condition. One condition? Uh-huh. That you tell me what it says first. I wrapped around to see the old librarian the next night. The shades were down. Library hours were over. Old Hillary Waters let me in. His face seemed to be burning with excitement. I've made an amazing discovery. A most amazing discovery. Your great-grandfather was put to death. Oh, that's no discovery. Don't interrupt, please. I have documentary proof that Daniel Zenger was a man of extraordinary vision and prophecy. And I... Present my proof. First, tell me, was he rich? From all indications, fabulously rich. He accumulated a princely fortune. And he did what with it? I cannot say. But that is of minor importance. It is the remarkable scope of his prophecies I am principally interested in. Okay, spill it. What did he prophesy? In these manuscripts, written in the 18th century, in about the year 1790, Daniel Zenger predicted Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, our civil war between the states, and the rise of Abraham Lincoln. And the First and Second World War. You're kidding. I'm in earnest. There were other remarkable predictions. Your... Your name is Theta Zenger Lion. Four generations removed from Daniel Zenger. Yeah? What about it? This obscure passage I came across in his book of predictions. In the fourth generation, a lion will come to the crest of the hill. And then... Over high gate. Well, what are you eyeing me for? Me? 
You're thinking the reference is to me? Yes. I must think that. The lion. That is you, plainly. Theodore Lion. And you're the fourth generation. And the crest of the hill is Hill Crest. This town. And you're the master of Highgate now. What does the rest of it say? He will first silence the waters. Then capture the jewel from the king. Thirdly, after seven days of wanton darkness, he will fling a tarnished stone into the earth. And a flame in the sky will show him the four keys. There's a final line. Read it. And the lion will sit with a ransom at his feet, and the winds will steal him from the wrath of the world. Funny change had come over the old librarian. He looked as if he'd run out of the room if I wasn't standing right smack between him and the door. I started toward him slowly. That uh, prophecy you read to me, if there's any truth in it, it means that if I complete the three steps referred to in those clues, I'll reach a certain four keys. And lay my hands on a fortune. Yes, yes. It purports to mean that. That's not quibble, huh? It means just that, period. Now, boiling certain words down. Words like silence, capture, and fling. The three steps mean three murders. Believe me, it is madness to accept or even interpret them literally. Let's skip the weasel talk. It boils down to those three murders, doesn't it? No. Liar. First, he will silence the waters. That's you, Hillary Waters. I must first silence you. No, it's insane. You can't run away, old man. I've got to silence you. <laughs> the chair came down on his skull and he dropped. And my thumb on his windpipe for a couple of minutes. Eh. And I'd satisfied the first clue to a princely ransom. I'd silenced the waters. <laughs> He will silence the water. Is there anybody around whose name is stream, flood, lake, or maybe river? Hmm. <laughs> Old librarian Waters had a look in the book and the prophecy took. His name's Muddy Waters now. A lion will reign over the high gate. Yeah. If our hectic hero keeps on exterminating quaint old scholars, I predict a lion will take it on the land. <laughs> Let's uh, verify my prediction, shall we? Okay, lion, roar. I propped old Hillary Waters on a chair at his desk. There wasn't a telltale mark on him. He looked as if his heart had backed up on him while he was poring over his books. I moved into Highgate. With old Daniel Zenger's second clue burning in my brain. He will capture the jewel from the king. What did it mean? I couldn't even begin to figure it out. All I could do was wait. And watch. A month dragged by. And one night at the railroad depot, I watched the signal flag go up. Watching the trains roar by and sometimes stop was a way of getting a peek at the world outside of Hillcrest. I watched a girl get off. Young. Made up and dolled up in a style that yelled for a second look. She looked like my world. A big town, bright lights, fast talk. I moved toward her like a guy in the desert starts for a pitcher of water. The funny thing, she was coming right at me, too. Could you direct me to the nearest hotel, handsome? I could even carry your bag there for a price. A local wolf, hmm? What's the price? Smile. <laughs> okay. Now I'll pick up the bag. I'm Ted Lyon. You? Ruby Myers. Your business in Hillcrest? What are you, the local DA? <laughs> no, I'm just a guy with time on his hands. <laughs> I'm an advance agent. Advance agent? Uh huh. Ballyhoo. I nail up posters, hire a light local hall, and I start the promotion and publicity going. It's really a man's job, but we women do it better. Who are you publicizing? Slugger Conlon, the middleweight prize fighter. Conlon's barnstorming, putting on exhibition bouts. He'll be here Friday night. Well, uh, what are you doing after working hours? Between now and Friday night. Oh, I, uh, haven't thought about it. 
Yes. Got any suggestions? Any? Sister, I got a million. Before the end of the week, we knew each other a whole lot better. Walks, dances, movies. There was someone behind me, pushing me. As close to her as I could get. You're as nervous as a cat tonight. What's eating you? Uh, nothing. Uh, what are you doodling? Doodling? Yeah, you've been scribbling absentmindedly for an hour. Well, let's see it. He will capture the jewel from the king. That's a funny doodle. What does it mean? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's a line I read from a poem somewhere, maybe. Um, Ted. What? We, um, we got to break it up after tonight. I'm, um, uh, I'm somebody's girl. In love with Slugger Conlon? No. Then why brush me off? Well, I've got to. The king's crazy jealous of me. If he saw you around, it'd be murder. Did you say the king? Did you call Slugger Conlon the king? That's his nickname. I'm up for... Well, what... what's wrong? Nothing. Nothing. Just the idea of losing you, that's all. Ruby. Yeah? Just came to me. Ruby is a precious jewel. Uh -huh. Oh, now you're making with the sweet talk again. Come on, Jewel. Let's have a last dance before the king claims you. Capture the jewel from the king. Second clue in the prophecy had been right under my nose for a week. But I hadn't seen it. When Conlon came in one day ahead of his party, I was right there at the depot waiting for him. Ruby was back at the hotel, freshening up for her boyfriend. Slugger Conlon? That's me, kid. I'm Ted Lyon. Uh, I represent the town athletic committee. Uh, welcome to Hillcrest. Oh, thanks, kid. Where can I dig a shower, a steak, and a flop in this flea town? My car's over there. Pile in. I'll drive you to a hotel. Deal. The town's all head up about the exhibition, Bob. King? <laughs> you know my nickname, huh? I've put on a show. Just everybody turn out a buck sixty-five ahead. Hey, uh, how far to town is it? Another half mile. What are you stopping for? A uh, flat tire. There's a break for you. I'm going to love this town. Well, where do you keep your jack? Don't bother worrying about the jack, Conlon. Hey, I don't see no flat. Say, what gives? What's a gun for? You, King. It's a stick-up? Huh. I haven't got a plug nickel, kid. Turn around. Sure. But you won't find a sound of me, I'll tell you. Uh, uh. The king was dead. I'd buried him in an abandoned quarry, baggage and all. His party arrived the next day. They stood over why Slugger Conlon hadn't showed up, and then they left the following Monday. Nobody thought of making a search for him, checking with the railroad. Luck was with me. King had pulled more than one disappearing act before, and his crowd was used to it. The party left, but the jewel stayed. A week later, I married her. Where are we? Honeymoon, handsome. In Highgate. We'll spend seven days there, alone. Thirdly, after seven days of darkness and want. There was only one way of interpreting the third clue in the prophecy. I closed Highgate to the world, and I settled down to seven days of darkness and famine. It was slow agony. But without it, I'd never find the four keys. Without it, a lion could never sit with a ransom at his feet. The first ruby resisted. Soon she began to suspect that she'd married a crazy man. Ted... Ted, I've got to get out of here. You'll stick for seven days. No, not even seven more minutes. I'm getting out of here right now. You'll stick it out, I said. You'll stick it out if I have to chain you to the floor. You're mad. You're crazy raving mad. No food, no daylight. It's endless dark. But seven days passed. I was ready for the next clue. He will fling a tarnished stone to the earth, and a flame in the sky will show him the four keys. 
fling a tarnished stone into the earth. What did it mean? Ruby! Oh, leave me alone. Leave me, darling. Come outside, Ruby, into the daylight. Ruby, I'll make all this up to you. All this suffering, I swear I will, Ruby. I'll sit with a ransom at my feet, and you'll sit right beside me, and there'll be gold and trinkets. No. You'll sit in the hot seat, and I'll sit 20 feet away with the witnesses, watching you burn. What do you mean, watching me burn? I sat there, starving, with my body dying by inches, but my mind was alive. I could think. I figured out your crazy doodling and all your crazy recitation. He will capture a jewel from the king. I figured out what that meant. You better stop talking, Ruby. Try and stop me. King. Slugger Conlon. I know why he never showed up that night. You met him and killed him. <sighs> Ruby stood there, pale and beat up looking, accusing me. The clothes were ragged. She'd lived in them for seven days and seven nights. The hard illusion of beauty was gone. Hunger had aged her seven years. The jewel had lost her sparkle. The tarnish of a misspent and wasted life was all over her. He will fling a tarnished stone into the earth. There was a voice behind me. The voice of someone whose hands were pushing me toward Ruby. Pushing me toward the fourth clue in the prophecy. It was old Daniel Zenger. You're, you're going to kill me. Yes. I didn't know then, Ruby, that you were the jewel and the tiny stone both. It's no use trying to resist, Ruby. I'm too, too tired, Richard. My fingers on your throat for just a little <laughs> while. It won't hurt. Too much. <laughs> she hung limply in my arms. And I flung her to the earth. And then there was a flame in the sky. A lightning spear. It seemed to fix in the sky. Pointing like an arrow on an illuminated map. The flame in the sky will show him the four keys. I followed the arrow across the countryside. There was a wind behind me pushing me on. Old Daniel Zenger was behind me driving me. I reached an ancient cemetery that was hidden in the Lost Valley. Then the flame was gone from the sky. And in front of me... It was a mausoleum. The date on its stone face read 1790. And under it was a family name, Key. The door was unlocked. I turned the knob and opened it. And the wind slammed it shut behind me. The iron door had a knob on the outside only. There was no knob on the inside. I'm in here now. Trapped, too weak to move, hearing voices. And the winds will seal him from the wrath of the world. The dead are all around me, waiting for me to close my eyes and join them. What is Connell and Ruby? I'm in here to stay. The ransom, my feet, cold coins. Think it's to go back to the time of Queen Elizabeth and Sir Walter Raleigh. With the lights are going out for me. The jackpot I won. No good to me now. No good to me. The lion will sit with a ransom at his feet, and the winds will seal him from the wrath. <laughs> now, there's an industrious lion for you. He built his own cage. <laughs> A piflicated prophet named Pennypacker once said, Lions in stone cages shouldn't throw predictions. <laughs> what some fellas won't do for a buck. Kind of brings a moral popping out of a wide crack in my brain. If a dead ancestor cozies up to you, start traveling, Bob. 
fan out on a horizontal line before all you can get is vertical transportation. Sanctum has been brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Slither in, won't you? Hmm? Sorry the place is such a mess. I'll sweep it up later. Those are just chips off the old block. Been doing my bone work. (laughs) Oh, didn't I tell you? Sure, I'm going back to skull this term. All cozy now. Ready to string along with us for a while. Good. After all, this is a newspaper story. If you feel a little cold as we go on, it's only because we have a story to tell you. (laughs) Tonight's inner sanctum mystery, Death of a Doll, was written by Fred Matho and stars... Mason Adams in the role of Will with Ted Osborne as Bo Cousins. This is the story of Willie Harper and the devil. And how Willie, on his first assignment for the morning blade, finds himself at two in the morning, sweating nervously in the murky shadows of a riverfront street. Willie has a gun in his pocket and a doll that belongs to a dead girl tucked under his arm. A block away, leaning against the one streetlight, impassive, grotesque, ape-like, is the devil waiting for Willie. I keep saying this is 1948. And I keep saying this is Manhattan. And I keep saying whether you believe in the devil or not, you don't meet him till you're dead. But believe me, that's the devil over there under that lamp. At three o'clock, He's coming for me. Sure, you've got a right to think I'm crazy, standing around waiting to be killed with a doll under my arm. This all started ten days ago, around five in the afternoon at the city morgue. Grundy, the night editor, sent me there on my first assignment. The morgue, he says, is a good place to start for stories. Looks like you might be in luck, son. How that? Come along with me. What's your name? Will Harper. (laughs) All right, Willie. Come down to the coolers with me. Yes, I'm very wrong. I've got a story in there for you. The girl in locker number seven. She's been here four days. 
Tomorrow we close the case, Anna. What does that mean, Mr. Jackson? It means... In spite of everything the police have been able to do, we can't find out her name, where she lived, or anyone who knew her. How was she found? Tugboat crew fished her at the river. Tomorrow, she goes to the city burial grounds in a plain box marked Jane Doe. That's horrible. Just dying and nobody... Do you think she was murdered? There's not a mark on her. They say she wasn't. But I want you to look at her face. And tell me what you think. This is Jane Doe of number seven, son. Jane, this is Willie Harper. I want you to see her face, Willie. Tell me what you see in it. A strange emotion shook me. She didn't seem dead to me. Her skin was perfect ivory. Her hair was fine, spun copper. Her lips twisted slightly. I, I blushed and turned away, catching myself imagining what those lips must have looked like with life's color in them. Jackson led me back to his office without speaking. As I lit a shaky cigarette, he fished a brown paper bag out of his desk. He handed it to me, tilting it forward as he did so. What the devil? Yeah. And when they pulled her out, she was clutching this doll close to her. Even the doll hasn't helped trace her. The police are through with it. Mr. Jackson, you'll think I'm nuts. I suddenly feel sore, boiling mad. I don't know why, but I think she was murdered. The, the look on her face is... Kind of ask you uh, help? Yes. Dead girl, nobody wants. And a doll. Here's your story, Willie. Too bad you didn't know her before. Yeah. Well, thanks. Here. Take the doll along, Woody. I beat it back to the paper on fire to do a story about the dead girl and her doll. As I gave him a Grundy Ma report, he stared at me. When I got through, he had a sort of twisted grin on his face, sort of know it all. He grunted and tilted the paper wrapped doll forward. Think she was murdered, huh? Yes. The cops don't think so? No. They're closing a case tomorrow? Yeah. No clues, facts, or anything outside of this town? None. All right, Harper. I'll give you another day to find the nasty character who did this horrible thing. Cops have been wrong before. Go ahead. Thanks. I'll get a story. <laughs> Take your dolly along. And keep falling with the dead ones, Harper. You're better off. Now I know why I resented that crack of McGrundy's. He must have guessed before I did that I had fallen in love with the girl in the morgue. Half hour later, disgusted with my own morbidity, I went to my room before going out to eat, slammed the door and tossed the doll into a chair. I couldn't shake the feeling that the nameless girl in the morgue had something to say to me. If only the doll could talk, could tell me about it. What was she like? Was her voice soft? Was it kind? Who was cruel to her? Where did she live? Who killed her doll? Who? I grinned sheepishly at myself in the mirror. And with that gesture, this story really begins. The next few moments remain electrifyingly vivid. I had set the doll down on the bureau. I didn't touch it. Wasn't even looking at it when a new sound came from it. I stared at the crumpled, ridiculous little form. Almost afraid to touch it again, but I did. I had to. I picked it up and tilted it limply. 
Karanana. That was what I had heard. A sound? A sound only? No. Somehow I thought it was more than a sound. A name? Maybe a name. Half because I didn't want to stay alone with the doll any longer, and half on a hunch. I stuffed the doll in his bag and went back to the paper. I went straight to the reference room, filed the doll under my arm. What, what are you looking for? I want to know if you've got anything in the files on someone named Karanan. I spelled with a K or a C. Huh? <laughs> well, it's funny. You seem amused. <laughs> Don't tell me he's around again. If you've got a lead on Karanan, you've got some story. Oh, will you get me the clips on him? I'll get you Myers' anthropology of Asia. He's in there. Anthropology? Why? Who is he? The devil. Karanana. Of course, an almost forgotten myth from Asia. Lucifer on Earth, wearing out one body after another, walking the Earth always. I remember it now from college. I did on a long walk and headed down Fifth Avenue, my head whirling with a maddening conflict. I think I would have given up the whole thing then but always at the point of going home to bed or of chucking the blasted doll in a can. The face of the girl in the morgue blanked out her other thoughts. When I reached Washington Square, it was dusk. The sidewalk artists were packing up their canvases as I passed them, all but one, that is. He was a tall, angular man with a completely bald head whose four or five paintings had the advantage of a street light. The man paid no attention to me. Until at the sight of one painting, I stiffened in utter shock. What's the matter, friend? The stuff that bad? That one. The one of the girl. It's woman with a doll, I call it. Like it? Who's the girl? Do you know her? Tell me. Sorry. I'm selling oil paintings, friend. I'm not dating bureau. No, 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 no. You've got me wrong. I've got a good reason for asking. Look, I'll prove it. Here. Here. Isn't this the doll you painted with a girl? Where'd you get that? I haven't seen Hazel in a week. She left for the coast. I gave her that doll to pose with. What's wrong? Hazel is dead. Dead? Where is she? If I tell you, will you promise to say nothing for a while? I'm a reporter for the Blade. My name is Will Harper. I won't say anything unless I believe you had something to do with it. Where is she? I'll take you to her. She's at the city morgue. An hour later, we had come out of the morgue. Oh, cousins had simply nodded at my questioning look. Seeing the girl again, knowing her name now, added to the emotions I already felt for. I had a sudden impulse. We handed the artist Hazel doll. Are you giving me the doll? No, no, I want it back. But I want you to tilt it. Make it cry. <laughs> what did that sound like to you? What did you hear? The doll said, Karanana. You heard it too. Again, say that name again. What did you hear the doll say? I distinctly heard it say, Karanana. Then I'm not crazy. And do you know who Karanana is, Mr. Cousins? I'm afraid I do. The most fantastic coincidence I ever encountered. Why? Do you know who Karanana is? The devil. Lucifer, Satan. White. I think we'd better go to my place and talk this out. Certainly if what I think is true is true, no one will believe us. What do you think? That Hazel was murdered by Karanana. I followed Bull Cousin silently along the dark streets of the lower city. His long legs led us finally to a dingy, narrow, fish fowl street where we climbed an outside stair to the loft of a warehouse. You're in love with her, aren't you? An amazing circumstance, be in love with someone you met too late. I could have loved her, yes. I met her at a bar remission house. Conceived the idea of painting her with a doll. Somehow that seemed right to me. Go on. Well, we worked here for three weeks on the painting. I paid her enough so that she could go to California. Dream of hers. One night as we walked the streets nearby, Karanana appeared. Karanana? Yes, Karanana. Or a man who calls himself Karanana. The devil or the human form of the devil. However you choose to think. But there can't be such a thing. That The devil is just a myth. Is it? I met him in Istanbul eight years ago in a cafe. Did a painting of him. What's he like? Squat, massive man, ape-like. As I painted him, he admitted to me such crimes that I could hardly hold my brush. Like what? He made his living professional murderer. Very discreetly, very cleverly, very effectively. Why didn't you turn him in? <laughs> really, now. 
I like to paint. And to live. He was so pleased with the picture I made and gave him that he told me any time I needed to rid myself of some embarrassing person, he'd be around. Lucky you, but who'd believe that story? We do, Willie. And that's the important thing. Do you have any spare cash? Why? I have about $150. If you could make up the difference... I think we should claim Hazel's body and give the child a decent burial. I fixed it up with Jackson at the morgue. And the three that afternoon, Bo Cousins and I, plus two grave diggers in Simeon Cemetery, were watching a bright new casket being lowered into a new grave. Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow, and never continueth in one day. In the midst of life, we are in death. Thanks, Paul. I like it too, Willie. Very much. You're a nice guy, Willie. Wouldn't you rather go now? No, no, let's, let's wait till she's covered over. I want to talk to you. I've just gotten an idea. Oh, I know how to make things come out even for Hazel. I know how to get Karanana. And I will be very glad to see that you're buried next to Hazel here. I see things a lot clearer now that Hazel has a name and a past for me. If there is a man named Karanana, as you say, I think he's human, and that's an even chance. Maybe Karanana isn't the one. Then I'll find out. Do you want to help? In any way, short of being discreetly disposed of? Yes, well. Karanana said he'd do a little job for you whenever you wanted him to, right? Yes. Then you get in touch with him and... Sorry, Willie. My merchant of death is unreachable. He shows up when he wants to. All right, I'll wait. But when he does, you've got a murder for him to do. I have? Who? Me. That was a week ago. An exciting week for me, covering all sorts of stuff in the paper. I'd begun to think Bo Cousins was an imaginative phony... Even my editor, McGrundy, had stopped kidding me about Hazel's doll perched on my desk. Then this morning at 9.30, I got a call. Morning, Blade, Willie Harper. Greetings and farewell, Willie. This is Bo Cousins. Bo. What? What's up? The devil is in town, Willie. He wants to see you. Karana? Yes, I saw him last night. He was delighted to help me get rid of you. I see. I told him you were a reporter who was planning a story about art which tore my work to pieces. What's the matter, Willie? Change your mind? No, no, no. Did he say where? He never lets his clients in on the details. But he did say I'd be rid of you by 3 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, thanks, Bo. I'll be seeing you. Quite seriously, Willie. I hope so. Be careful. Remember, bullets don't work on some things. Bye. So long. By 3 this morning, you said. I didn't know where, exactly when, or even if I could get the drop on the devil and force the truth about Hazel out of him. I stuffed the doll into a bag and started out, but McGrundy caught me. Harper! Yeah? Woman shot through the back of the head. Blank solitaire. 147 Parkway North. Husband with her. One out on it and phone it in. Right. When I hit the lobby downstairs, an unaccountable chill got me in the small of the back. Something made me stop short and turn around. It was my first look at Karanana. She was leaning against a phone booth, a heavy set, ill shaped man whose arms sloped weirdly from his neck into a heavy stomach. He was eyeing me impassively. The game was on, I knew. I grabbed a cab to get my story just the same. I phoned the stuff in from the cigar store across the street. When I stepped out of the booth, Taranana, I just bought some cigarettes. He turned to me as I froze, waiting. Some murder across the street, huh? Yeah. How'd you know? I get around. Murder a hobby of yours, mister? No. It's strictly a business. So long. That's the kind of thing that went on all day. McGrundy kept me on the hop, and no matter where I went, Taranana was there ahead of me. This afternoon, I got to my room long enough to pick up my Luger pistol and the license I've got to carry it. He was waiting for me when I came out. Better put it in your inside coat pocket. It shows on your hip. Be seeing you. It's a quarter to 
quarter to three now. Fifteen minutes. And he hasn't moved from under that lamppost in two hours. I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting another minute. I'm going to meet the devil and have it done with. He doesn't move. Will a bullet do it? Can I trick him into admitting Hazel's murder? Or will he kill me first? Well, here I am. Yeah. I see. What can I do for you? It's almost three o'clock. <laughs> you know, you're right. Time sure flies. Well, time for me to get on home, I guess. So long, Willie. It's a trick. A fiend's trick. He's deliberately leaving me with only a few minutes to go. I've got to stop this. I can't go through with it. I'll go to Bo's place. I'll tell him to call it off. I don't want to die. I don't Billy. want to... Oh, oh, Bo! I was running for your place. That's right. You might be down this way. You look scared to death. And you should be, I guess. I've got a high bow. Let's beat it somewhere. It's almost three. All right. Quick, cross the street, Willie. There's a broken down pier there. Come on. Pretty dark here, Willie. But we'll stay for a while. You certainly have worked yourself up. That's the doll you've got there. Yeah. I don't know why I carried it. Glad you did. Got a gun with you? Yeah, my Luger. Let me have it. You're too wrought up. Here. Good. Now be still a moment. Three o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Three o'clock, Willie. Time for us to part. What do you mean? You are not a very astute person, are you, Willie? Why? Maybe Hazel's doll will continue. You! No! No, Paul, this is crazy! You're... The same water that receives Hazel is at your back, Willie. The time is free, and tomorrow you will be fished out with the doll under your arm. Your car on Anna. White. Farewell, Willie. Hazel, poor sweet child, learned the same truth by accident. Dirty, filthy little... <laughs> Farewell, Willie. And you shall take your... Darling, darling, darling. Stop him! Where? I said run the kid doesn't stop No! No, I will not! <laughs> Ella, no, no. Never die. How's the head feel now, Willie? Better, Mr. Grundy. Thanks, lots better. My professional pride hurts more. Well, it needn't. Your father threw like an old timer on that story, didn't he, Shea? Yes, he'll do. How could I have taken you for the devil, Inspector Shea? <laughs> I've been called worse. How did you know where I was going to be and all that? How come you were on hand at the end? Well, I cover the morgue, Willie. When a young guy suddenly decides to claim a nameless corpse, it's time to follow up on it. Well, you seemed okay, but Cousins turned out to be wanted as a professional killer. So you tagged me to get to him? Sure. He was after you, no doubt about that. Oh, uh, there's your doll, Willie. Yeah. Well, I tilt the doll and nothing happened. No sound. Must be broke. I guess she doesn't have to speak anymore, Mr. McGurney. I think the doll is dead. Hey. Want to buy a doll? Hmm? I'll sell it to you, but there'll be the devil to pay. Take a tip from Willie Harper. There's no romance at the morgue. You'll find nothing there except cold, hard figures. <laughs> Sorry I've got to skip along now, but I've got a date with Hazel Dahl. She promised to help me in a grave situation. I've just got to dig up something for next week's show. I think if we work at it long enough, we'll turn something up. Don't you? Hmm. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. <laughs> this is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. You'll have to be very quiet tonight because one of our guests is asleep in the deep. <laughs> Poor chap, he was a sailor by trade, an old salt named Peter. Uh, he had a corpse in every port. But I'm afraid he went overboard. You see, people made him sad. And he had a nasty habit of drowning his sorrows. <laughs> his last voyage was over a large body of water, the Dead Sea. And he was blown into it by a stiff wind. But it was too crowded down there. Five phantoms deep. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Cause of Death, was written by Bob Sloan and Ed Adamson and stars Barry Kroger in the role of Ken with Santa Ortega as Al. Well, Gather round, my friends, and you shall hear a midnight tale of death and fear. It's full of ghosts and rich in gore, and if you listen, you'll sleep no more. <laughs> now sit back in your uneasy chairs as Ken Griswold tells us his weird story. Death held no terror for a man like me. I'd seen the dead too often. Lived among them, worked among them. And to touch the still, cold flesh of a corpse was a routine experience. For ten years, I'd been the coroner of Redmond County. I'd seen death in all its cruel, twisted forms. And yet, there had never been one like this. It all began up at the lake. Even the coroner has nerves, and mine had begun to get the best of me. So Inspector Al Hendricks gave me a week off, and I went up to Grandview Lodge alone. On the third day of my vacation, I was sitting on the lakefront dock when I heard my name called. Ken! I turned and saw Al Hendricks coming quickly down the hill. Ken! I'm afraid you'll have to interrupt your vacation. What? You've got to come back to town. Come back to town? When? By the way, I'm driving you in. Oh, now, wait, Al. I haven't had a vacation in almost three I years. I know, I know. I wouldn't ask you to come if it wasn't important. This is a very special case. Why? What's so special about this case? Uh, a woman was found dead in her house at 11 this morning. There doesn't seem to be any visible reason for her death. Well, there's got to be a reason. So far, we can't find one. There's always a reason. You'll find one. You'll have to find it for us, Ken. Me? Why must it be me? When you get there, you'll understand why. What do you mean, why? Because it's Helen. What? Yes, Ken. The woman who died is your wife. There she is, Ken. Al Hendricks pulled back the sheet. And for the first time, I saw my wife, Ellen, in death. Her face was twisted into a strange smile. And her eyes seemed to stare at me through half-open lids. But somehow, the aura of the dead wasn't about her. It was as if... As if she were only asleep... Dr. Vincent and I stayed there for three hours, testing, analyzing, checking, 
back over every bit of evidence which might give us an inkling of the cause of death. And when we were finished, I asked Dr. Vincent to send Al in. Well, Ken, what's the verdict? Al, there is no verdict. What? It doesn't seem possible, Al. I can't believe it. Yet it's true. What are you talking about? Ellen's death. There's absolutely no cause, Al. There's no reason for her to be dead. Now, wait a minute, Ken. You said yourself on the way down from the lake, if somebody dies, there's got to be a reason for it. Some cause that makes them stop living. Yes, that's what I said, but this is different. Death is death. How can this be different from any other? I don't know, but it is. You mean she just stopped living, only you can't explain it? No, that's not what I mean. I have a feeling that Ellen didn't stop living. That she didn't stop living at all. On the official certificate, the cause of death was listed as unknown. Two days later, Ellen was buried. That night, I sat in the half-dark living room. Outside, a howling wind slashed at the French windows that led to the lawn. I couldn't sleep. Couldn't get the thought out of my mind. The thought that I should never have allowed them to bury Ellen. I just sat there, the idea searing deeper and deeper into my mind. And suddenly, one of the French windows was flung open, and the cold wind whipped into the dim-lit room. I've come back yeah. At first, I thought it was just the echoing wind playing tricks. Then I heard it again, stronger. I'm here, Ken. It was her voice. Ellen's. You're not afraid, are you, Ken? She stepped out of the shadows and stood there before me in the yellow light of the lamp. She was dressed just the way she was when they put her in the coffin. The gold bracelet I had given her glistened on her wrist. Why do you look at me that way? It's not you, Ellen. Oh, yes. It can't be. You're dead. Am I? Really? You were buried this morning. You died two days ago. Don't you remember, Ken? You told Inspector Hendricks I heard you. Ellen didn't stop living. Oh, oh, this is just a dream. You know why I didn't stop living, Ken? It's because you can't make a wish like that come true. What wish? Don't you remember? You said to me, Ellen... I wish you were dead. No! No, Ellen, I always loved you. You didn't. You never did. When Carl was nice to me, you hated us both for it. You thought I was going to Carl, and so you made your wish. You wished no, I... that I would die. I, I, I didn't mean it, Ellen. I swear, it was just something I said in anger. You wished me dead, Ken, but you can't kill by willing it. You can see now. That I've lived on. Oh, this isn't real. You're only in my mind. It's just my nerves. No, Ken. Yes, it is, it is. It's nothing but a trick of my imagination. I'm as real as you are. I'm flesh and blood and bone, the same as you here. Oh. Here. Touch my hand. I, I, I moved back. But she kept coming closer and closer. And then I turned and ran across the room. I saw her follow after me. I got to the bedroom door and I slammed it. Oh. I turned the key in the lock. I stood there in the dark, my heart hammering a tattoo of fear that shook my whole body. I tightened my fingers around my throat to hold back the scream that cried silently for release. And then it came. She was knocking at the door. I couldn't hold it back any longer. Kevin's you got here? I got the call from your neighbors down the road. They heard you scream. What the deuce has been going on here? She came back, Al. Huh? Ellen, I told you she wasn't dead. Oh, now, look. No, I'm not crazy. You've got to believe me. She was here. She tried to get into this room, and that's why I locked myself in. Now, you listen to me. The last couple of days have been rough on No, no, wait a minute. I know what I'm talking about. Ellen's come back. I said you listen. Your wife was buried this morning. I was at the funeral with you. She was buried, and it's all over. Had a nightmare. Just a nightmare. Things like that happen to all of us. 
She wasn't here. She couldn't have been. It wasn't a dream, Al. She was here. What are you talking about? On the floor, there. That bracelet. That bracelet was on Ellen when she was buried this morning. After Al left, I went out to the cemetery. The moon dropped a pearl-gray blanket over her grave. I dug feverishly into the fresh earth. I still had to prove to Al that Ellen lived on. The bracelet wasn't enough for him. I dug deeper. Deeper. I just about removed all the dirt that covered the casket top when the shadow of a human form fell across the grave. Hello, Ken. How? I went back to your house. You were gone. I figured this is where I'd find you. You're wasting your time, Ken. She's in there and dead. <clears throat> Before Al could stop me, I bent down and snapped open the coffin hinge. I pulled up the lid just as he jumped down beside me. Close that coffin! I told you not to... Ken! We stood there in the grave, our eyes fixed, staring into the empty coffin. Al, you've got to listen to me. Now, Ken, do what I told you, will you? Go into your room and get some sleep. We'll talk about it in the morning. Oh, Al, you've got to listen to me now. I can explain everything. I know what happened to Ellen. I know why she wasn't in a car. Someone's playing a trick on us. The dead don't rise from their graves. But she wasn't dead. Not really dead. She was here tonight in this room. That was a dream. No. No, she was real. She spoke to me. She was alive. And she'll be back again tonight. I know it. I can feel her coming closer. Al, she's coming back. She's going to come back. Stop it, Ken. Stop talking like I that. I can't face her again. I, I'm afraid. Don't, don't, don't make me stay here. Al, please. Please, you've got to help me. All right. All right. You can come over to my place. Now, wait. Don't leave me. Now, take it easy. Just wanted to get some of your things out of this closet. Ah! Look! In that closet. Helen was in that closet. For a moment, she just stood there, rigid and white, her eyes burning into me, her lips twisted into the same strange smile. She seemed to want to come toward me. But she fell forward to the floor. She lay there, silent and motionless. This time I knew she was really dead. The knife in her back told me that Ellen would never return to me again. I feel kind of sorry for our coroner friend, Ken Griswold. He never should have picked out that sort of job for himself. Working in a morgue is enough to make anybody slab happy. That place can really get you down about six feet down. It's like they say, death is always just around the coroner. <laughs> oh, yes, about Ken's wife, Ellen. Let that be a lesson to you the next time you make a wish over a vulture bone. That's the way some women are. Stubborn. You can't get rid of them. Dead or alive. <laughs> well, now let's get back to Ken Griswold as he continues his tale of terror. After we found Ellen's body in that closet, I knew I had to get away from that house forever. I wanted to run out into the night, but I couldn't move. Some force held me stationary in its grip. The room began to swim crazily. I saw Al Hendricks come towards me, but a black curtain fell between us, and I was lost in a deep hole. Feeling better, Al? Where am I? What is this place? County Hospital. You've been here two days. Two days? Yeah. You blanked out. Ellen, she was murdered. Now, you've got to take it easy, Ken. We won't talk about that now. I have to talk about it. Don't you see, Al? I was right. Ellen had lived on. No, she was already dead. With that knife in her back. You only die once. What I said before still goes. Somebody's playing tricks. Al wouldn't listen to me. He told me to try and get some sleep. Then he pulled down the shades and walked out of the room. A little later, 
The door of my room opened. In the semi-dark, I could see that it was a woman dressed in white. She stood at the foot of my bed. Good evening. Who are you? Well, I'm your nurse, sir. Here, drink this. Ellen. My name isn't Ellen. I'm just the nurse. You're Ellen. You've come back again. Now, now, you mustn't excite yourself. Just, just, no, please, drink this. No, no. You're no, sleeping. No, don't. You'll feel much better after. Oh, you've come to take me with you. I know what's in that glass. You can trust me. It won't hurt you. I won't you. die. Take it away. Take it away. Oh, no, no. I knocked the glass out of her hand. Crashed to the floor. She just stood there looking down at me, that same twisted smile on her face. I slid out of the bed. Now, you mustn't get up, sir. You're not well. She came towards me, her hand outstretched, just like the other time. She came closer and closer. Let me help you back. No. I won't hurt you. I got to the door and opened it. I started to run down the corridor when something gripped my arm. Put me tight to the spot now. Let go. Please, for heaven's sake, let go of me. Let go of me. Uh, take it easy, Ken. Please, take it easy. Ow. Oh. What's the matter with you? You're supposed to stay in bed. Oh, let me go. i got to get out of here. You're going back to your room. No, Al, I can't go back there. Don't make me. She's there. What? Ellen, she's coming back again. Hey, now, look. No, You've got to believe me. She's in there waiting for no, me. No, Ken, it's just your nerves. I was outside the door. Oh, her voice and her face weren't the same, but I knew who she was. I could tell by that smile of hers. She's posing as my nurse. That's how she got in. But that can't be, Ken. You don't have a nurse. <laughs> You don't have to worry about her coming back anymore, Ken. Ah, oh, she will. It was all in your mind. I think I can make you see that now. What do you mean? You felt responsible for Ellen's death because of that fight you had with her. That's why your imagination ran wild. Oh, but Al, that bracelet, her body in the closet. Like I told you, she was dead all the time. Somebody was playing tricks. The man who murdered your wife, we've got a lead on him. What are you talking about? What man? One of your neighbors gave us the tip. Two o'clock in the morning on that day your wife was found dead, a man was seen leaving your house. He was tall and wore a black hat and coat. The murderer must have known that you were at Grandview Lake. But it couldn't have been murder. The autopsy would have shown that. We couldn't find any cause for Ellen's death. There's always a cause. We'll find Ellen's murderer somehow. When Al left, I thought back over everything he had told me. Someone was playing tricks. A tall man in a black hat and coat. I kept searching my mind, probing... And then the idea struck. Something Ellen had said. When Carl was nice to me, you hated us both for it. You thought I was going to Carl. So you made your wish. Carl. Carl Denson. They wouldn't allow me to leave, but I found a way of getting out of that hospital. And I went to see Dr. Carl Denson. Yes, what is... Hello, Denson. Why, Ken Griswold. I want to talk to you. Yes, of course. Come in, come in. I heard you were in the hospital. I got out of there tonight. The way you uh, say that... Uh... Call it escape, if you want to. Look, Griswold, you're not well. And that's what you want them to believe, that I'm crazy. I don't know what you're talking I'm about. I'm talking about Ellen. You killed her, Denson. What? You murdered my wife. You couldn't have her for yourself, so you killed her. You're mad. I read the report. Ellen died of causes unknown. You killed her. And now I know how you did it. You're a doctor. You'd know about things like that. There's an artery in the neck, the carotid. If you apply pressure on it the right way, the victim dies. And there's no evidence of murder. You can't bluff me, Griswold. I... I... I I came out here to kill you. Then uh, to choke the uh, life out of you. Like this. I changed my mind. You fool. You crazy fool, get out of here. Yes, Denson, I changed my mind. You're going to die in the electric chair. I told you to get out. I'm going to prove that you killed Ellen. You can't because I didn't. A man was seen leaving the house on the morning Ellen was murdered. You were that man, Denson. You knew I was up at Grandview Lake. You waited until I was away. You forgot something, Griswold. It couldn't have been me. I'll prove it. You forget. At the same time you were up at Grandview Lake, I was there too. I went back in my mind, and I remembered that Carl Denson had been at Grandview Lake while I was there. But I knew Denson was the murderer. He was the man in the black hat and coat. He had found some way to come back to town and kill Ellen. 
But I had to prove it. I started out to retrace his steps on the night of the murder. The train let me off at the Grandview Lake Station at four in the morning. I phoned for the village taxi and ordered the sleepy driver to take me out to the lodge. Uh, uh, I don't like to make trips this time of the night, mister. Don't worry, I'll pay you extra for it. Only hurry. I can't go much faster. Trouble with you city folks, always hurrying to get nowhere. Reminds me of the fellow I drove last week. City fellow, too. Get off the 401, just like you. Says he's in a hurry. Wait a minute. Yes? You said he got off that same train? Yep, that's what he said. Same train as you. What day was that? Uh, let's see. Was it Tuesday? Tuesday? Yes, yes, it was Tuesday that. Uh, what did he look like? What do you want to know from me? Tell me, what did he look like? Well, he was a tall fellow. Didn't talk none at all. Couldn't see much of his face, had his coat collar up. The thing about that, wasn't cold either. Was he wearing a black hat? Come to think of it, guess he was. Yeah. Black hat and coat. Where did you drive him to? Same place you're going, mister. Grandview Lake Lodge. That proved it. I was right. Denson had gone to town to kill Alan. Then when he finished, he returned on the early morning train. I had him now. There was just one more step left. When I walked into the lodge, George, the night clerk, was behind the desk. Good morning, Dr. Griswold. Hello, Griswold. George. Uh, we weren't expecting you, but we have a room. I'm not we? staying. Oh? George, I need your help. Yes, of course. What is it? It's important. You must remember something. Uh, remember? About Dr. Denson. You know him? Yes, certainly. Well, this happened just one week ago, last Tuesday morning, at the same time. You were on duty then? Uh, yes. And you would have seen anyone walk through the lobby here? Yes, I would. Dr. Denson returned to the lodge last Tuesday morning. He was wearing a black hat and coat. He came in here at this same time. You saw him. No. But you must have. I didn't. He came in here. I have proof. The cab driver who brought him here from the station saw him enter the lobby. I didn't see Dr. Denson that morning. You're lying. You did. No, sir. The only person who came in early last Tuesday was you. What? You came in, Dr. Griswold. You wore a black hat and coat, and you asked me for a key to your room. Me? That's right, Ken. It was you all the time. How? Now, be good, Ken. Don't make me use this gun. And Al, did you hear what he said? Yeah. That means I killed her. I was waiting for you, Ken. I knew you'd come. I'll let you find out for yourself. I, I don't remember. You're a doctor. You know about those things, split personalities and stuff like that. You just can't see it in yourself, I guess. But her body in the closet. That was you, too. I followed you out to the cemetery. You thought she was still alive. That's why you put the knife on her back. I'm no expert on those things, Ken, but that's the way it looks to me. Okay. Let's go. I couldn't go back with him, not that way. I ran across the lobby. Stop, Ken! Stop right out the show! I got to the door and then... Oh! Oh! Well, it burned in my chest. Al turned me over on my back. I'm sorry, Ken. It's all right, Al. This is just the way I wanted it. Al's gone for a doctor. I haven't got much longer. No. I won't be here when Al comes back. I won't give them any trouble with this one. The cause of death. This one's easy to determine. <laughs> Say, no wonder that Ken Grizzle was glad to die. Some wives are bad enough alive, but imagine being henpecked by a corpse. You know, that's the trouble with the folks you meet around here. They're dead, but they just don't know enough to lie down. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's a good moral in tonight's nerve-shattering narrative. If you're thinking of doing away with your spouse, forget it. Brother, you haven't got a ghost of a chance. <laughs> this is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares, live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in, come in. Brrr, it's getting cold. Yeah, we're all blowing on our hands. Those of us that have hands. <laughs> One character who hangs his sheet in our happy little inferno got frostbite so bad we had to amputate his leer. <laughs> oh, well. At least the big freeze has brought us one blighted blessing. The stiffs around here will keep refrigerator fresh. <laughs> Tonight's inner assigned to mystery, Murder Faces East, was written by John Robert and stars Carl Swenson in the role of Steve with Charlotte Holland as Selena. Tonight's candidate for oblivion is a chap whose hobby is collecting nightmares. <laughs> oblivion comes with a crash when our boy discovers an idol is no... Idle jazz. Hang on, everybody, and we'll fill in the gory details. We're in a gloomy cell of a city prison in San Francisco. On the edge of a lower bunk, sitting with bowed head, is a man. A recent arrest. He's still dressed in street clothes. His tie is missing. So are his suspenders. Confiscated as a precaution against suicide. His eyes fix intently on the stone floor as if trying to stare a blind spot out of his vision. And his mouth twists into a distorted curve of amusement. I've got a million dollars. I can't even buy a tie or a pair of suspenders or even five cents worth of freedom. Began for me with a penny postcard in the mail. Selena, my wife, read the card to me over the breakfast table. Public auction of the estate of Hanson Brokaw. Rare oriental treasures. Masks, statuary, talisman. I went. Some fellas play chess or collect stamps. I hobbled in orientalism. Selena came along to see that my blood pressure didn't pop bids out of my mouth at a bankrupt us for a month. A hundred lots have been sold, a parade of bronzes, ceramics, and brocades that were the haunting fascination of the Orient. Lot number 101 on the platform was a bronze Hindu idol, small, six inches high, with a sardonic grin that looked real, as if a human laughing face had been frozen into a bronze mold. Number 101, a Hindu idol. Bid lively, folks. Uh, $50. Is 75. Steve, you're mad. Now I want it, Selena. Not want... over 100, darling. We can't afford it. $75, 75, 75. $100. $100 now. 100, 100, 100. I hesitated. I have and then the idol decided it for me. I watched it move suddenly, just for my eyes. It moved to the east, toward my aisle position, compelling me as if an invisible string was drawn between us. $200! Steve! $200 once, $200 twice, sold! And the Mr. Kavanagh. I owned the Hindu idol. At the close of the sale, Selena and I were leaving when a man approached us, a gaunt, swarthy man with hollowed-out cheeks, wearing an eastern fez. Mr. Kavanagh. Yes? I am told you are the fortunate purchaser of the laughing idol. Ah, uh, what about it? It was my intention to buy it, but I arrived too late. My car was delayed in traffic. Oh, that's too bad. Better luck next time. Perhaps I can be lucky this time. 
if you will, sell the idol to Oh, me? I don't think so. The Honorable Hansen Brokaw, its late owner, was found mysteriously killed. An ancient Burmese axe embedded in his skull. Oh, why do you want the idol? Like the late Mr. Brokaw, I am a collector. Oh. I will pay you a very handsome profit. How much? Five thousand dollars. No uh, sale, mister. No sale at any price. Outside, we were hurrying up a deserted side street, me clutching the idol, when the promise of things to come began in a rush. Five thousand dollars, Stevie, offered you a fortune. No, I couldn't sell it. Don't ask me why, Selene. I just couldn't. <laughs> Rifle shot. Came from across the street, someone firing down from an open window. Quick, come on, duck into the alley. <laughs> Somehow we got home alive and whole. Selena went to bed in tears. Her brother Howard, who lived with us, coaxed the story from her. I hate to play Patsy between a man and his wife, Steve, but isn't possession of that idle kind of borrowing trouble... We don't know that, Howard. Someone tried to kill you. There were two rifle shots from a window. That's all we know. We don't know that they had to do with the idol. Someone did offer you $5,000 for an idol you picked up for 200 Now, how about a little sense? Get rid of it, Steve. No. That idol was on the auction stand facing the middle aisle when the bidding began. And I was sitting on the side aisle. When I wanted to quit bidding, it moved to the east toward me. See, I was meant to buy it. I was meant to own it. I was meant to own it. <laughs> I set the idol on a strip of oriental silk in the center of my desk and sat looking at it, studying it. It sat grinning at me as if enjoying a secret surprise it had already prepared for me. Hello? I speak with Sub Stephen Kavanaugh. You are? You were pleased to come to the mosque on Street Caraca, house number 24. What for? When you come, you will know Sub. And please to come after dark with... The after dark, I was to come to a mosque in Frisco's Oriental Quarter after dark. <laughs> Another man, any other man, would get on the phone to police headquarters. But I went. 24 Caracas Street. A cop's whistle out of Frisco's Chinatown. The place was empty. No furnishings, just a few scattered prayer rugs, a makeshift altar, and a bony old man wearing a fez. It was chalk white, as if he just climbed off an embalming table. The sub Stephen Kavanaugh. In person. I am Jin Khan. Okay. Tell me why I'm here. Because you possess the laughing idol. And because it is written that Jin Khan must serve the possessor of the idol. Serve me? How? Your danger is great, Saeed. Uh -huh. Now, see, <laughs> your enemies will strike, but you will reach riches and power. The idol will show you the way, and Jin Khan will serve you. Serve me? How? Now, see, it is written that when it faces to the east, Jin Khan will talk to his ancestors and then come to you. I wrapped the idol up and left. A thousand doubts were whispering in my head. Outside, I had to pinch myself to remember that I was in the States. Everybody had closed up shop and gone home. The street was deserted, not a sound. Except the cat's whining meow. And then I got a sample of what Jin Khan had meant by your dangers, great. 
The first I knew of it was a cold breeze whistling an inch past my head. A sharp-edged instrument had narrowly shaved me and buried into a building side. It was an ancient Burmese axe. One inch closer, and I would have been dead. Nothing like a hobby keeps you mentally fit to be tired. <laughs> but what gives? A chap buys an auction sales bargain and some creep applauds him with a blast of gunfire. And to top it off with a hand-tooled coffin lid, a second creep chirps bravo with an axe. Looks like that Hindu idol is going to make Saab Kavanaugh permanently idle. Let's see exactly how said retirement is accomplished, shall we? Mm. I sat around at home for days with the idol right in my view. My wife, Selena, avoided me. She suspected my sanity. <laughs> I was moving the dark ages right into the middle of my home. I watched the idol for hours, hypnotized by it. It sat grinning at me. And then I saw it move to the east. A gong I'd once picked up in an eastern bazaar and hung in the foyer of my den sounded. <laughs> Saeed Kavanaugh. How'd you get in here? There are informal ways, Saeed. The idol faces to the east. Yes. Right, right under my eyes, it moved. I have spoken to my ancestors. Now I will offer you the second of my humble services, Saeed. The second? What was the first? The axe that buried harmlessly into the wall when you left the mosque. You live, Saib. That was my first service. And the second? What's it? It is written that the Chandra Ruby will fall to you. What? What is the Chandra Ruby? You will know, Saib, when you seize it. On this paper, you will find your instructions. Go after dark. Goodbye. I opened the paper. It was a message scribbled on old rice parchment. A drawing like a surveyor's map with some writing on it. It said, Mount Fiore Cemetery. The drawing was a picture of an exposed coffin. And in it was a figure dressed up like a mummy in a sarcophagus. And markers showed the exact position of the grave. An arrow pointed to the left eye of the corpse. <laughs> that night after dark, I stole into the Mount Fiore Cemetery. The storm was threatening. The grave had no markings, no tombstone. I dug. I dug four feet down. I reached the coffin. It lay exposed, with the rumbling skies giving it a ghostly glow as if someone had rubbed it with phosphorus. I wedged the edge of a pick into a side and pried it, it open. Exactly as drawn, it was a mummified corpse, a strip of face, what was left of it, peeked out. Just the nose, the eyes, and part of the brow. One socket was empty. And the other, the left eye, the eye marked by an arrow on the drawing, gleamed red. A lightning spear in the sky caught its radiance, and the eye seemed to burst with a ruby fire. And flicker and dim as the lightning passed. 
The Chandra Ruby, Jin Khan had said. I was the owner of the Chandra Ruby. <laughs> A rare oriental ruby set in the skull of a corpse. <laughs> well, I didn't swallow that. Going home, I dropped into Saperstein's jewelry store for an appraisal. Uh, rubies, as you know, fluctuate in value. Well, yes, I know, I know. But just uh, give me an uh, approximate idea. Is it worth, say, $1,000? Uh, <laughs> you can safely multiply that figure by 50 for an approximately fair price. Fifty thousand dollars? For days, I hardly slept watching that idol. And then on the fourth day, the idol moved again to the east. I have spoken with my ancestors. Yes. It is written that you will reach great wealth and power. But first, an unhappy task awaits you, Saab. Oh, an unhappy task? You must kill to save yourself. Kill? Yes, Saab. Who do I have to kill? Your wife. Kill Selena? No, no, that's insane. Why? To save yourself. Her hatred for you rages in her mind like a fever. Her wish to destroy you is overwhelming. Selena, kill me? No, I, I don't believe it that. It is so written. Search her mind, sir, and you will know. Search her mind. And convince yourself. Jen was gone. Murderer. Or be murdered. That was something to swallow. Search her mind, Jin Khan. It said twice as if there were a clue in his speech. Search her mind. How? How was I to search her mind so that I could know? I thought about it hard all through the evening. And then. Her diary. Selena kept a diary faithfully. I found her diary in a drawer of the night table. Selena was fast asleep. I thumbed through it noiselessly, reading into Selena's secret mind. Jin Khan was right. Selena lived only to hate me. A page written just the day before proved it. The unbearable act life with Steve. The bleak, sick days and the terror. When he touches me, I wither and fall away. One day I will destroy him. I must or be destroyed. Destroy or be destroyed. Murder or be murdered. I stared over at Selena and then there's something, the intensity of my thinking maybe. Awakened her. Steve. Steve, you've been prying into my diary. No. Not into your diary, into your mind. I've been prying into your secret mind. Steve, what's come over you? A revelation. What? I have been living with a fraud. A murdering fraud. Steve, you're out of your mind. Kill or be killed. Do you hear, but... Selena? Marriage boils down to a comical simplification. Kill or be killed. Murder or be uh, murdered. Isn't it funny, uh, Selena? Huh? No, no, <laughs> please, please, no. <laughs> ah! In two minutes, it was over. I left her curled in her last sleep, turned the key in the lock. I had thinking to do. I'm planning. How did a sudden widower explain his deceased wife away to a curious world? I still hadn't finished. Hadn't found the answer when Howard came to the breakfast table. Steve, if I could speak up frankly, just once. Straight from the shoulder. Go 
Go ahead. That Orientalism mania of yours is degenerating you into something unhealthy. Now, why not call it quits? Selena's edgy and depressed. She feels rejected. You push her too hard, she's capable of harming herself. Harming herself? You're hinting at suicide? Yes, Steve. I'm hinting at that. Exactly. That was my way out. Suicide. Selena just wouldn't come back from her early morning walk. They'd find her in a lake. A victim of despondency and hysteria. When night came, I'd transfer the corpse to another setting. <laughs> Somebody... Is that my door? Yes? Western Union. Telegram for Mrs. Stephen Cavanaugh. Well, uh, I'll take it. I'm Mr. Cavanaugh. Sign here. A telegram for Selena? I opened it. Came from New York. Firm of Englander, Fowler, and Barbonell, attorneys at law. The wording was a formal invitation to appear... And collect about a million dollars. This is to inform you that the will of your late uncle, Thomas de Haven Chalmers, names you as sole beneficiary. Please communicate to us the date of your arrival in New York. <laughs> a crackpot recluse that we'd all been joked about had left Selena a million dollars that she didn't have the slightest use for now. Great wealth and power, Jin Khan had promised. By succession, the fortune was mine now. If I could make murder the perfect crime. When night came, I drove Selena toward Apple Lake. It was just outside of town. Selena was fully dressed, gloves, shoulder bag, right down to the last accessory. A frantic wife on a solitary walk had taken the fatal plunge. I got to the lake. I carried her carefully to the water's edge, ready to complete her suicide. I never got to carry out my plan. You're all right, Cavanaugh. You can't get away with murder. Four other troopers besides myself are ready to blast you. Try to make a fight for it. Uh, how'd you know to follow me here? Five minutes before you started for Apple Lake, your brother-in-law got a peek into your wife's bedroom through the porch window. I'm in a city prison on the first lap that leads to the electric chair. Uh, Governor. Yeah? That hysterical yarn you blabbed at the prison stenographer when we brought you in. Yes, 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 yes. We checked every detail. Nothing checked. Okay, so I'm nuts. I had a nightmare. We stopped in at Sapistine's jewelry store, just for the sake of routine. At Sapistine's, your zany story suddenly rang true. Oh, we ran into as ingenious a plot as I've ever encountered. An ingenious plot? It was at Sapistine's that your brother-in-law, Howard, purchased the stone you called the Chandra Ruby. Howard? Mm-hmm. We got a confession out of him. Why? To capitalize on your weakness for Oriental Bunkum. It was worth investing $50,000 for a genuine ruby. Uh. Worth forging entries in your wife's diary. And putting you through the paces as he did. All to sell you the idea of murdering your wife. <sighs> he knew an uncle had died in New York. That after Selena, the sole heiress, you came. That after you, burned for the murder of your wife, he came. Uh, but Jin Khan. A hired stooge. Like the man who offered to buy the idol from you after that auction sale. Everything that happened to you was staged from a script prepared by your brother-in-law. And you played leading man, as if you were born to the role, sucker. Are you feeling the chills creeping up your spine? Stay tuned for more spine-tingling tales. But if you dare to experience real-life thrills, click on the link in the description. Prepare to be whisked away on a heart-pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand as an American driver navigates and narrate the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares. Live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see 
may haunt you forever. Good evening, friend. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in, come in. We had a surprise visitation here a scream or two ago. A sightseeing delegation simply crazy to take it all in. One onlooker's mouth was so agape you'd think his face was split from ear to ear. Confidentially chum it was. <laughs> The head of the delegation was terribly proud of his honorary title. Poor chap, it was the only head he had. <laughs> ah, yes. Things went along cozily until some wag suggested holding hands. We brought out a trunk full of hands we keep for just such occasions. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Between Two Worlds, was written by John Robert and stars Mason Adams in the role of Sam with Anne Shepard as Connie. It's Yuletide Week in South Chicago as a flash electric storm whips the streets. Inside the 10th District Police Station, Chief Matthews and his clerk Daly are passing the time over a game of chess. Suddenly, like a bolt from the heavens, a window pane crashes. And a parcel fastened to a fist-sized rock drops to the station house floor. It's a package tied to a rock, Chief. And what's in it? Uh, a notebook, Chief. A five-and-dime notebook. And all written up like a confession. It's signed, Sam Tyler. Sam Tyler, never heard of him. Read me what Sam Tyler's got to say. Ever come face to face with death? And just stand around helplessly, waiting for it to tap you. Waiting, waiting for, the for the final count. Yes. While you're waiting, your heart is a big clock ticking off your doom. And inside your head, a moving picture's going on. You're looking at the story of your life. And it's not a pretty story. It's all black. It's all bad. You hate to die without a single good mark in the big book. If you only had just enough time to chalk up one good deed. It happened like that with me. I came face to face with death. Death was Nick Fazenda. I lost face with Nick. The big guy liked his racket boys tough and nerveless, and I had a streak of chicken, Nick said. I had a streak of chicken. And I knew too much to be trusted alive. What do you want, it, chicken? Nick, don't do it. Give me another chance. Dying like this scares me. What's waiting for me after you pull that trigger, Nick? I haven't done one decent thing since I was born. Here, you picked the wrong setup. You should have joined the Boy Scouts. So long, chicken. The shot made a noise like a TNT charge, but I hadn't felt the impact. I hadn't felt anything. Either I was paralyzed with fear or dead to feeling. Or Nick had missed. I watched Nick stare unbelievingly and aim again. An easy bullseye at five yards with Nick a crack shot, but still no impact. I was still standing up. Kid, fall down. You're dead. No, Nick. I'm alive. You can't kill me. Nick, you're seeing a miracle happen. You're crazy. Nick, I'm going to get that chance. I'm going to live. Two <laughs> more shots, but still no impact. I was alive, uninjured. Something was happening to Nick. His face was purpling as if he was suffocating. As if some invisible stranger had his hands around Nick's throat, strangling him. Get her. I'm choking to death. I hope. Nick was on the floor. I watched the color wash out of his face, watched him go rigid. I crouched and listened to his heart. Not a sound. Not a murmur. He was dead. Nick had dropped dead. I'd seen a miracle happen. I hopped a midnight freight heading east. I was in a boxcar loaded with crates of eggs, still sweating over my narrow escape. And I got a spooky feeling that I wasn't alone. I lay still, choking back my breath with my hand tight around Nick's gun. You have no need for the gun, Sam. How, how did you know my name? I know all about you, Sam. Put down your gun. It's up and the trigger is cocked, so no tricks or you're a goner. <laughs> a goner. 
too late for that, Sam. I am a goner already. What kind of crazy talk? I died, Sam, just one year ago. You're, you're your own ghost. Uh, get your hands up high, Mr. Whisker, so I can frisk you. I reached to frisk him, slap his pockets for a rod, but there was no one to touch. I was only grabbing at empty air. I told you I died a year ago, Sam. I saved your life tonight. I gave you your wish. Your chance to do one decent thing before you died. Did you mean the promise you made? No. A scram. It drive me crazy. Then you lied in the face of eternity. I'll have to recall the time given you... What do you mean, recall the time? You're living on borrowed time, Sam. You were meant to die by Nick's first bullet. You remember how Nick died? Yeah. All of a sudden, he couldn't breathe. But like, like his lungs were gone and his heart was calling quits. Like you're beginning to feel now. What? Like I... I... I can't breathe. I'm choking. My lungs are exploding. When I came to, Mr. Whiskers was smiling over You me. did mean your promise to tomorrow, didn't you, Sam? Sure. Sure I did. Anything you say. Then continue on to Chicago. When you arrive there, spend your time waiting in a restaurant called the Spread Eagle. Sooner or later, you will be approached. You are to lend yourself to any situation that arises. Any situation, understand? Sure. Sure, I understand. This, uh... This good deed I'm to do on borrowed time. What's your interest in it? Deeply personal, Sam. I am no longer among the living, but I have no place among the dead. I walk between two worlds. You see, Sam, in life I didn't have one decent thing to point to either. Mm. Through you, I hope to find rest. In Chicago, I tried to get Mr. Whiskers... Out of my mind. <laughs> I'd had a bad dream. It had to be a bad dream. I went to the spread eagle, afraid not to. I just sat like a frozen mummy ordering ham sandwiches. I couldn't eat and coffee. I couldn't swallow and listening to downbeat piano music. Mind if I join you? Pull up a chair. I'm Tresca, Sam. You know my name, huh? I know your name and all about you. Where you come from, your record, and why you're uh, on the land. <laughs> you know all about me, too, huh? I've watched you. I had a confidential operative check into your uh, pedigree. What for? Well, frankly, because I need just such a person as you. For a certain uh, venture I'm involved in. What do you mean, just such a person as me? I wanted a man who's at home in, shall we say, unconventional activities. A man I can trust because he doesn't dare go to the police or uh, even to the underworld. And I'm your man, I guess. You definitely are. Okay, let's go. Well, did you agree just like that? Without even uh, discussing price or the nature of the work? You said I was your man. Fact is, Tresca, I'm your man, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, this is our destination, Sam. Here? In the middle of nowhere? Up that footpath over there, say, uh, one-eighth of a mile, you'll find a private lake. I own it. All right for you. Yeah, thank you. And there lies your uh, first chore. Behind us on the floor of the car is a burlap sack. Its weight, I would estimate, is uh, 118 pounds, more or less. What? 
We've been riding a corpse around. We have. You're to carry the burlap bag and contents up that footpath to the lake and drop it in there. And without tears, Sam. Mind you, without tears. From this point on, as the saying goes, we're in business, Sam. What's the next event? Wedded bliss for you. I'm to get married? You are. Tomorrow evening, you'll call on your radiant bride-to-be at uh, this address. Fifteen cantilever walk. Yeah. And <laughs> try to look more cheerful, Sam. Love comes but once into every man's life. Mr. Whiskers giving me the horse laugh somewhere as I climbed the steps to 15 cantilever walk. Big gray stone as if someone had imported the side of a mountain. Iron over every window. And gloomy enough to give even a crepe hang in a St. Vitus dance. I rang the door, Buzzy. Hi, Sam. Do I kill the bride before or... After the ceremony. Make yourself at home, Sam. Wander about. I'll see what's keeping your blushing bride. I wandered about with my eyes popping over the expensive layout. Whatever Tresca's game was, it wasn't Penny Ante. The joint screen, big stakes, right down to the needlepoint footstool. Where did Mr. Whiskers figure in it? A minute later in the library, I began to catch on a little. Mr. Whiskers was right in the game. There, sitting over the fireplace in a big gold frame, was Mr. Whiskers. You like the portrait, Sam? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite a painting. Uh, who is Mr. Whiskers? <laughs> Mr. Whiskers. That's a trifle irreverent, but an apt nickname. He was my brother, Stephen. Was, huh? He's dead. You sound as if you were ready to dispute it. I just asked, is he dead? Very much so. Dead and buried. Your manner is a little odd, Sam. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, Reggie. <laughs> Getting married is an idea I've got to... <laughs> got to get used to. Well, <laughs> then meet your bride. That's one way of bringing the idea to roost. Uh, Constance. Sam, uh, this is my niece, Constance. Constance, this is your fiancé, Sam Tyler. Hello, Sam. Hello. Well, I'll leave you to get acquainted. <laughs> you want to exchange premarital views on love and uh, homemaking. There wasn't a blush in my blushing bride. Her cheeks were chalk white. Her face had the look of death. Like some creeping sickness had already called two strikes on her. Sat down at the piano. I stood watching her. Looks like you're stuck with me, kid. If Tresca has his way. Tresca will have his way. What's your angle, kid? Why is the niece of a million dollar layout ready, willing, and able to marry a deadbeat ex con and mug? I'm obliged to marry. What do you mean, obliged to marry? The terms of my father's will. I. Inherit his estate at midnight tomorrow. Only if I married. It's beginning to make some sense. Mr. Whiskers up there. Was your father? Yes. But well, why pick me? A mug your uncle brought home. Why not why not scout your own, dearly intended? I can't. <coughs> Well enough to... <coughs> hey, you sound as if you're not even well enough to live. No, Sam. I'm not well enough to live much longer. We were married with Tresca and the scrubwoman standing as witnesses. 
I shacked up in the big jail at 15 Can't Ever Walk. I was the legal husband of an heiress, but I wasn't congratulating myself on my good luck. There was a hidden gimmick somewhere. I pried. I searched Connie's room. I found the hidden gimmick in a lady's handbag. The handbag was crammed with the usual junk girl stock, a powder case, lipstick, nail file, comb, plus a driver's license and a Christmas club bank book. But they weren't in Connie's name. The name on them read Ann Powers. I got it as fast as I read the name. The girl was a ringer, another patsy in Tresca's game. You needn't feel too guilty, Sam. What? I left my handbag where you could find it. I had to look. Tresca killed his niece and hired you to stand in for her. Are you going to deny that? No. How did you come to, to fall in with Tresca? I was in a restaurant. Tresca came along and hired me. My life, Sam, every bit of it hadn't been good. I couldn't die leaving it all bad. You wanted to do one decent thing before you died. Yes, yes. <laughs> You made the wish and Mr. Whiskers appeared and took you up on it. He sent you to Tresca and Tresca hired you. You're going to tell me that's what happened. You're hurting me. Is that what happened? I asked. No. I don't know anything about this obsession you have with Mr. Whiskers. (laughs) What good deed can we do around here, kid? Tresca murdered his niece to steal the estate for himself. We had just pawned. Hooray for Tresca. Connie's father left the money to charity if his daughter failed to marry. Constance refused to marry. She wanted the bundle to go to charity. Yes. To atone for her father's past. His life hadn't been much either. A million dollars to charity. That's a lot of squaring up. That could be our one decent act, yours and mine, Sam. Make Tresca's scheme pay off. Quite an ambitious undertaking for newlyweds. Huh? Oh, now, don't you two look at me as if I were another supernatural or occult visitation. I entered through a secret sliding panel on the north wall. I overheard your odd tainted tate simply by downing earphones. The room is wide. You don't miss a trick, huh? What's the gun for? What are guns for? was a charge like stale air exploding. I spun around but didn't drop. (laughs) This was where I had come in. Tresca, like Nick, could empty his gun point blank, but he couldn't rub me out. It was exactly where I had come in. There in front of me, Tresca was getting the same dose Nick got. His face was purpling as if he was suffocating. As if some invisible someone had his hands around Tresca's throat. Having trouble with your breathing, Tresca? I... I can't breathe. I... He was on the floor, rigid, out for keeps like I'd seen Nick once. Is he dead? Deader than a doornail. We sat around the three of us. Tresca, the girl, and me, waiting for Mr. Whiskers. We sat all day and all night and through half the next day, but Mr. Whiskers didn't show Mr. Whiskers didn't show as if he never was. Sam. What? He exists only in your mind. (laughs) You're waiting for a man who died a year ago. (laughs) How do you explain that to yourself? I don't explain it. Maybe Mr. Whiskers doesn't have to come anymore. His job is done. One last thing, and our job is done. What? One last thing, Sam? The cops. We tell them what gives and hand a million bucks over to charity. That's the one decent act, the purpose that brought us here. It's the purpose that brought you here. I just hired out to Tresca for pay. What about that wish you made on the docks, kid? It was different on the docks. I was sick and broken... Hopeless? I'm not broke or hopeless anymore. I can buy a cure. I can take a trip, spend money, all kinds of money, have a good time I never knew. I can laugh. You're saying we shut up and keep the estate between us. (laughs) Why not? 
in a way we earned it. No good, kid. I've got a promise I've got to keep. A promise you made to a ghost? My promise to tomorrow. But if you can't keep that promise because I won't let you, what if I won't let you cheat me out of my one chance to live? Oh. Like this? She backed away from the piano with Tresca's gun in her hand. The gun is no good. I don't kill, kid. You saw how I don't kill. That was before, Sam. You do kill now. Don't kill me! No, no! There's uh, one last line, Chief. Uh, sort of a dying scribble. The girl was right. I did kill now. That's the end of it, Chief. What do you make of it? Suppose we let the answer write itself at 15 cantilever walk. Well, the confession is the McCoy, all right. That's Sam Tyler on the sofa, Tresca on the floor, and there's the girl out cold, still holding the gun. Got any pulse? No. She's dead. No visible cause, Davy. Just dead. I'm getting a faint pulse on Tyler. Sam. Sam Tyler. What? You the police? Yes. The girl shot you and you just about bled to death. You know the whole story, Sam. So the girl got to do that last decent thing after all. The girl didn't do anything. Her heart blew out after shooting you. We read your confession down at headquarters. My confession? Yes. This five and dime notebook. Yeah, see it? It was tied to a rock and tossed through the window at headquarters. You wrote it, but what we want to know is who delivered it. <laughs> I, I didn't write that confession, Mr. <laughs> I didn't write it. Poor deliberate. <laughs> you didn't write. And it was the girl. She had enough left to get downtown and get your story to us. If not you, it had to be the girl. <laughs> You'll have to ask Mr. Whiskers about that. If you hurry, you might catch him somewhere between two worlds. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Gee. <laughs> taxpayer just told me the state of Illinois intends to mail a bill to Mr. Whiskers for that broken police station window. They're busy digging up a dead postman so he can speed delivery of the bill out of this world. <laughs> Sad about Tresca. A perfect plot gone to pot because his brother, although kaput, wouldn't stay quiet. <laughs> We invite you to join us again next week at this time for Inner Sanctum. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for more spine tingling tales. Subscribe and click on the notification bell to be warned about more episodes like this. Click on the link in the description to be whisked away on it. a heart pounding journey through the bustling streets of Rio's favelas. Experience the sights and sounds firsthand of, as an American driver navigates and narrates the vibrant chaos. Don't just listen to the scares, live them. Click the link below for an adrenaline rush like no other. But beware, what you see may haunt you forever.